law is not just for lawyers. Yeah. When citizens want to access law, they don't need to lo- read law reports. It must be simplified and it must be accessible. And they don't have to get lawyers. They don't have to get lawyers to understand that unfair dismissal, I have a right to refer to the CCMA. I don't need to pay you to tell me that. The labor court is very busy. Mm. And they are really short of judges. They are really short of uh, courtrooms. Mm. There's a report that says when the judge president always says that. While we accept that challenge, it does have an impact at the speed at which the case gets resolved because there are no courts, there are no judges. Mm. Ask yourself this question. How many of our members of society whose cases are sitting in the labor court, not prosecuted because they can't afford to pay a lawyer to make sure that the matter is in fact enforced. And they have an award from CCMA that, that says, says go back, go to, back work to work and work. then be paid. King King David Studio Podcast. You know, on the Wednesday show, we always bring you uh, people who empower us. And today I have uh, uh, someone whom I hope by the time I leave, uh, or he leaves, uh, I'll be able to make sure what is the process that I should follow uh, when it comes to labor relation issues. Um, he heads up a is it a is it a what you call it a an entity within government that makes sure that you and I are looked after in the process of of labor disputes and things like that? It's the CCMA. So we have with us Advocate Cameron. Uh, Advocate, how do I say your name? Morajan. 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 Basutu, yeah. I've been trying to understand Lenore Basutu Abatlakai, you know, but there's a history behind it as well. Yes, yeah. yeah. You know, most when you go Kasi, when you grow up and a lot of things happen, mm. and at some point you are connected to a surname or Kimurajan, and they said, actually, how Murajan, this is your real surname. Oh. You know, those type of things, <laughs> yeah. So yes. it's that kind of thing, yeah. Where, where did you grow up, though? I grew up in Heidelberg, Goratanda. Okay. In the in the East Rand. Do you know how we know it? Yeah. On our way to Devon. Yeah. And <laughs> three. That's the reference. That's to the N3. Yeah. Yes. And people stop there and all of that. Yeah. I grew up in in Ratanda, uh, Heidelberg. That's mm. that's my hometown. Yes. And it will always be my hometown. What's special about Ratanda? You know, I'm gonna tell you something very strange yeah. <clears throat> that people sometimes don't know or forget. Uh, other than these old you know, uh, struggle issues and Mm. and IFP. It was not at the high level. Did you know that Iratanda or Heidelberg, Mm. this is the one time where, or the town, where the AWB was born? What? Yeah, (laughs) that's where the AWB was born. In fact, if I'm not, if I'm not wrong, when Eugene Terreblanche fell on a horse, it was in Heidelberg. Wow. Um, It was a big (laughs) thing about, about the AWB. Yes. And all other, you know, movements yes. that are associated with that. Why uh, the formation there? What was it about this, the place? It, was it a predominantly uh, Bureborn type of, of it, environment? It is, an, it is an Afrikaans town. Yeah. It, is a sm- it has grown now. Mm. It is an Afrikaans town. You know, I remember when I used to walk with my grandparents to town and you go and buy in the shop, you'll, you'll, you'll have to speak Afrikaans. Yes. And employment. I, by the way, at some point, I worked on a farm mm. uh, when I was still in primary school because I grew up in an environment where we didn't have much. Mm. You know, it, it was a tavern, Kohai, and yes. that's the means of growth that we used. And therefore, during school holidays and sometimes on Saturdays, mm. I would go work on the farms. Yeah. But it was hectic on the farms. I mean, I remember one time when we're busy digging the trenches to put, you know, grass and all of that. Mm. It was about 30 degrees Celsius in a scorching heat. Yeah. You'll find this white guy standing over you from a swimming pool, fresh, <laughs> drinking beautiful drinks and eating something wonderful. But you're sitting there being a school child <laughs> and being there. And guess what we earned? For the entire week of working, Monday to Sunday, mm. we earned about 25 rand at Jeez. the time. Yeah. <laughs> and I worked there for two weeks and I said, you know, I'm going to take this as motivation. Mm. It's not going to break me. Mm. My focus is to become a lawyer because I decided to be a lawyer when I was done at seven. What motivated that? In I, at that time, there was, there was a lot, actually. One of the things that motivated me, I used to like a lot of legal dramas mm. on TV and ah, movies. Okay. Is there anyone that stands out? You... <laughs> yeah. In fact... Even before that, you know, when you're talking about Dukhamu Seneke, the former mm. Deputy mm. Chief Justice, he impressed me once 
I did not know when I was watching, when I was still in the PIC, mm. um, that he could speak Afrikaans so well. He was very, very fluent in Afrikaans. When I watched him, he was engaging with Afrikaans speaking persons, spoken Afrikaans, and I started investigating. So I studied law and all of those things. Yeah. Then his representations in courts and all of that. Mm. You know, the George Bezos and others to me, yes, they are there and everything else. But yeah. that one, <laughs> in fact, when I talk, when I joined CCMA, I told them that one day I'm going to be like him. Not only was he a good lawyer, mm. not only was he a good leader in the, in the PAC, but he became Deputy Chief Justice. True. And also, remember, they had a company with Motlana at some mm. point. Mm. And to me, it was fascinating to see a black organization yeah. that could go into corporate to that level. And it inspired me throughout then. And I said to my teacher, I said, you know what? Mm -hmm. I'm going to become a lawyer and a good one and just watch the space. And here am I. You know, interesting thing about about uh, uh, my mom like likes to say, I went to school with Khan in Atrishville. <laughs> <laughs> she says yeah. it every chance she gets. Yeah. It, it, interest, the interesting thing about uh, and the era of, of those gentlemen is there was something about them, gentlemanly about them. Hey. You know, there's something about them that there's some, they carry more than just the average guy. <laughs> I, I call them the distinguished gentleman. Yeah. You know that, that movie, Distinguished yes. Gentleman. I took the concept <laughs> because you have to have certain content to qualify to be called yes. a distinguished gentleman. I mean, yeah. the latest incident that I saw uh, Again, Goma Melior, I think, if not mm -hmm. Guatresville, you know, they did that walk wearing, you know, graduation oh, yes, and all of yes. those things. It happened township. in, in Atresville. Yeah. Yes. You know, when I saw that name, I said to myself, many of us are graduates from all different communities. Yeah. And part of it is the concept of Soweto, mm -hmm. you know, of building a good home and a good house, Gokasi, even if you are successful. Yeah. You know, Ivan Koza approach, which I really enjoy because. Our times will never be better. They'll always look like that because the moment you start growing wings, we fly out, but we never come back. Yes. So when you go back and walk the streets, it shouldn't be an event. Mm -hmm. It should be a regular feature because you don't know who you're inspiring because those That's who inspire true. don't tell you because some of the best people you admire don't tell you. Mm -hmm. And as we do that, and as we walk with our graduates, gowns and everything else, mm. our advocates' gowns and our tennis gowns in the streets, in the dusty streets, Kogasi. Yeah. We are inspiring those kids because future president, judge presidents and chief justices come from there. there. You, yes. know, you don't have to be in the suburb no. uh, to be able to be that. So I see he continues in that process mm. of wanting to inspire. In fact, at some point I did a case. Yeah. And in this case, they wanted to have access to the arbitration at the CCMA. They brought an application to do so uh -huh. because there's this perception that the arbitration cases, you can't access them, therefore they're private. They're not. Okay. They're a public forum. Mm. He made a judgment, but when he did that judgment, he used the old concept of people sitting under a tree and talking, like uh -huh. Lekhotla yes. and all of those yes. kinds of concepts. Yeah. And when I made that judgment, I took a lot of what he said, that when people in the past talk cases, mm. they're invited by the elders to sit there and talk about those cases. Yeah. And it's done in a public forum. Mm. So why would the arbitration be different? That's true. So there's a number of things about him that inspired me as a lawyer, as a businessman, as a mm. community person as well. Yeah. Even when he lost his brother and all of those kinds now, of things. Now, very recently. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. So, so that's what inspires you me. Know, you know, something that stands out, about about inspiration as a young child you said you were still in high school when yeah. you saw what he was doing it speaks to exactly what you mentioned that if we stop inspiring the, those that are coming behind us mm. which happens a lot more now mm. than before then mm. we had those references mm. but now we, we live in a, a generation of social media becomes the influence mm. and not not the guy uh, who is an advocate and mm. so forth and so forth. Mm. What do you say to those challenges that young people are facing today that your career doesn't look as sexy as, as an influencer? Mm. This is, I, I'll use myself as a template mm. uh, to answer that question. I want us to distinguish between motivation that is a good field discussion. Yeah. That's one thing because you can feel good at that moment, but the moment I stop talking, then then it's done. Mm. It's motivation, but you must close the deal. Yeah. What I mean by that is that after motivation, there has to be a program that ensures that to a large degree, it assists you to become what you can become. Because all of us should inspire to become the version of who we are. Mm. But sometimes 
you know, I'm, I'm also a godly and a religious person. Mm. I was listening to one guy, Joel Austin actually is one, mm. of the, one of the persons I listened to. He says that as we grow up, God places people in our path to steer us to our destination. Mm. In us, there's best of us. So as we motivate Gogazi, as we behave yeah. Gogazi, we must ensure that we install systems and programs that ensures that we progress to that level. Yeah. I mean, during the time of our school, we had this, this thing, a subject, a career guidance. Mm -hmm. That somebody comes, they buy the book, and then that's it. That's, yeah. that's how far it goes. Mm. It doesn't take you beyond that. But being in the township, there are institutions that don't exist. Libraries that exist are just simple, basic libraries. There's no anything other than mm. just basic books that you have. Yeah. So issues of care guidance, they just remain a topic. But I grew up I grew up without a father, so mm -hmm. I have to become and find people to inspire me. Mm -hmm. But over and above being inspired, behavior is important. Yeah. What I don't like what I see, Kokas, is that these things of money and materialism mm -hmm. seems to be the motivating factor. Mm -hmm. But the worst part of it is how the means are obtained. It's wrong for kids to believe that you can become a driver of a Mercedes-Benz because of who you know, mm. but without educational content. Mm. You have or a to... driver of Mercedes-Benz who's a span. Who's a span. And then you... <laughs> we, we, we told her, no, I'm not a Jereza. Jereza sounds very negative. Mm. <laughs> but the that is positive with the education content and True. progress, yeah. that's the kind of Jerez that we should be talking about, not yeah. the one that says, I have to steal to look rich. I have to wear expensive to look smart. Mm. Actually, stupid. That's mm. not that. Because if you don't have food, you don't have basic things in the house, but you can wear a shoe span that is worth 10,000 rand. There's something wrong with the mentality. Mm -hmm. So my view is that while we inspire, we walk those streets. Yeah. We have to ensure that we close the deal. That's it. Closing the deal, it means even if you adopt one or two kids and say, you are my project, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I will always make sure you have school shoes, yeah. you have uniform, you go to school, mm -hmm. you do your homeworks, you pass well, you have an ambition, mm -hmm. right? You see it through. Yeah. Not just come and deliver shoes and go into the media and say, I do my charity. Mm, charity take a picture. No. A selfie. No. Charity <laughs> means you do that, but you close the deal. That's it. For me, yeah. that's what we should be doing. Yeah. And and, and in terms of your schooling, mm. who motivated? If you say it's a, you had a fatherless environment, was yes. there a man around you? Yes, there was. Yeah. In fact, that's where the Sene Morajane comes from. Let me explain. Yeah. So, or Gohaine, Goratanda. We had a matriarch, Gohai, okay. Unobambo Joyce Jogaz, right? She is the mother of my mother, my grandmother. Mm. A very, very strong woman. I am who I am today because of her. Yeah. Even though we ran a tavern almost every day, I've seen all kinds of things from alcohol, violence, death, stabbing, all kinds of things you can think about. Mm -hmm. I've mm -hmm. seen that. My grandmother, uh, therefore, married to Murajan. Okay. Right? Yes. But my mother also um, did not know her father as well. Mm. So mm. It's, it's that continuation thing Yakukasi <laughs> as well. So the whole time when he worked go pick and pay as a butchery manager, and I would go there and see him work and all of that. Mm. So I managed to see that. That's the positive side. Even, who's, who's this you, you're looking at? That's my at grandfather. Granddad, yes. my, grand, my, yeah. my grandfather on, on my mother's side, right? But surprisingly, what people don't know is that in the bloodstream or in the tree, I don't have Murajan in my in my system because mm. my mom uh, or my grandmother's husband, who is supposed to be my grandfather, mm. Murajan, but actually he is not the father to my mother. Oh, you see okay. what I mean? Yes. So our line is not is not no, there. It's minimum, not, it has yeah. to be Chogazi because of my mother's yes, name. Yes. Yes. As close as they say that meaning course. you are born while still staying at home. Absolutely. That's what I am. But. Yeah. Because of that variation, because I've got siblings, mm. right? I've got four siblings. I'm the eldest. And I'm the only one with my own father. And the other three have their own. Mm. And the last one has his own. And with different surname, but grew up in a Murajani family. Mm. So my grandmother was very tough, said, in this house, this will be the only surname. <laughs> so, <laughs> so there was all the line. Told the line. Yes. 
<laughs> so then Morajan became the surname. Yeah. So then we grew up with that. With, with that. Fortunately, my other three siblings they knew their father. So at some point they changed and used uh, their name, okay. which was that. Yeah. So I continued Gamurajan. So later, as you try to discover yourself and say to your mm -hmm. mom, so who's my dad, Pila Pila, and all hey. of that. No. And interestingly, it is only now, David, yeah. that when I sat with my mother sitting there, because I visit Kohai and she, you know, go weekend and stay there mm. with my mom. My mom is Angoma. She's a mm. traditional leader. Yeah. She's always been, she's never been employed, ever. Interesting. Yeah. In my research, I found that small detail. Is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, she I is. did, yes. And, and I am that to yeah. her. Whatever she is, I am. Yeah. Right? So in that equation... And, and the fact that she has not worked and we have a tavern and that's how we grew up and that's where money comes from. We yeah. sold meat every day, you know, wow. to be able to make means for yeah. us to go to school, right? So we did that mm. and that's how, that's how money was made, mm. right? So in the family, therefore, when you're talking motivation, is to look at how strong my grandmother was to run such a big family. And we had other people that aren't completely unrelated to us, mm. but to stay in the house because <laughs> we're running a shebeen. True. There. That's why I was laughing when I look at some of these clips when you're talking about, you know, people saying that, no, I was in Santon, but I was in a shebeen. I mm. say, but I grew up in a shebeen. I don't know what shebeen <laughs> looks like, you know. So my grandfather, because of his provision, yeah. inspired. So my grandmother, really, I owe almost everything to her. I was inspired by that because with the little that she made through selling alcohol, because generally we think that alcohol is bad, but it depends on what you mean by that. Mm. Alcohol is not bad. It's people who drink alcohol who are bad. <laughs> so I'm here today. I'm not a drinker, really. I don't smoke, but I yeah. grew up in, in that house environment. with alcohol and drinking every day. It's a matter of choice. It didn't, that influ environment didn't influence you to to go in that line? No, not at all. Yeah. In fact, I was a very sportic person. Mm. I did a lot of community organizations, youth, sports, library. Okay. I established all of those things. Yeah. In fact, if you ask me why, I don't think it's just a matter of choice. I have a good inspiration called my personal governing body. Mm. I, my governing body personally has two members of the board. God and my ancestors, yeah. ancestors because of my mother. True. I will never abandon her, no matter how many degrees I have. Mm. The best degree I have is my connection to my ancestors because yeah. there are things in my life that happen. I do not know how they happened. I do not know how I survived the violence of the environment I grew up in. Yeah. I do not know why I did not become a drunkard or drink. We even sold dacha at home. And but I was part of this. But come, I grew up in that environment. <laughs> yes. which the risk of that, yeah. if I was arrested, Whoa. I wouldn't have been a lawyer because I would be fit and proper because a criminal does not become a no, lawyer no, no. because you don't yes. get admitted. Yeah. But it's part of the makeup that inspires me that despite environment, yeah. with choice and with inspiration and also with godly influence and ancestral power, you are able to avoid that. To me, therefore, when you talk inspirations, it's different factors True. that influence them. My mother's still standing today. Mm -hmm. Every time I see her, she's still very strong. And Mangola, I just go back to my saying from the doctor, I have this issue. Mm. She does it well and she does it extremely well for me. Yeah. So I'm inspired by that. And that to me is very important without a real father in a biological sense. I say the a traditional healing uh, uh, I'll call it skill, talent, or yes. it runs in the family. It does. Yes, even even in the Zulu culture, you find bagabanbani. That's mm. what they're known for. That's the skill they have. That's correct. So if 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 it exists in your family, did it did it spill over to you as well? Yes, it did. Yeah. And at some point, we are taught not to resist it. You know, mm. and fortunately, my mom guides me, and she protects me. Yeah, and because guidance of that nature requires no education. What is inspiring about that also, David, there's a case actually that went to the Labour Appeal Court and even in the Constitutional Court, Kivis current judgment. Mm. This is the only judgment in the country that exists now that recognizes traditional healers. Oh. Forget about legislation mm. and all mm. of that because one of the things that we're not doing well in this country is managing legislation. The customary and traditional healers legislation specific certain portion of it did not become law mm. but there was a very inspirational case of a lady who began like to us right and now she's employed and she went and said look 
to his employer, I need to go on your tour. So can you allow me and give me leave? Mm. The first problem was, what kind of leave are we talking Jeez. about? It's not sick leave. It's no. not study leave. No. It's not maternity leave. It's not it's, recognized. It's, it's not recognized anywhere in the statute. What? Right? Because the problem with that now is that decision makers are also not educated. Mm. So you come to sitting from your task and they say, so what do I need to do? No, you have to apply for leave. Mm. What kind of leave should that be? And then you know what they said to her? It must be a sick leave. <laughs> I said, why must it be a sick leave because I'm and not cool. sick? Yes. Yeah. But no, you were going to doctors and you've got these things happening to you. That's not sickness. No. That's me engaging the superpowers. Yeah. If you see the sickness, that's your problem. But let's educate. Mm -hmm. It's not. But you need to grant me leave. So eventually that became an issue uh, of leave. Of Our basic conditions of employment, as we speak, does not make provision for that. It still of doesn't. Thing. No, it still doesn't. Huh. There's a vacuum in that, but you've got thousands of Amatoasa that are supposed to undertake that process. What is interesting, what arose in that judgment, mm. again, because that's part of my system as my mom as well, is that when you're talking about me going to a doctor, which doctor are you referring to? Because True. there's a difference between calling someone a witch doctor and a traditional, traditional healer. healer. My mom yes. is not a witch doctor. No. She witches nobody. No. Right? In fact, she defends us against that. Yeah. Right? So when you go to a traditional doctor, they are not a doctor that is recognized in terms of the Health Professions Councils Act. Mm -mm. They are not there because they are not regulated there. They can issue a, a sick note. They can. Ah. This is exactly what became an issue yes. there. That they said, in fact, what is more interesting, David, is that when you're talking about an expert witness mm. in a matter that has to do with Uktuasa, who do you call? You mm. can't just call an academic. Mm -mm. Yes, they may add value to it. Funogule to go there to come and testify True. and say, Mang Tasa, this is what it's about. Mm -hmm. Right? And don't ridicule it, right? I like what the con court said mm. there. And they said, you know, people try to tease and try to undermine who we are and said, well, if you're connecting with the dead and you're talking with the which network are you using? <laughs> you know? Is that what they say? That's what people ridicule oh, and they no. ask. So what network are you that's using? How crazy. do you connect and how do you see? So what happens if you run out of data? Oh. That's ridicule. Yes. But I get seriously offended yes. by that. Right? Because they you see what the con court said mm. there and the LAC, that when it comes to our culture. And when it comes to our language, it is constitutionally protected. True. Which means, therefore, that anything else below that has to be done to accommodate and to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. What we have is exclusive. Yes. So you go to a medical doctor on a traditional healer problem for, for you to get a medical certificate which is compliant with the legislation that we call sophisticated. It's not certificate it's void. Mm. For it to be sophisticated, it has to be comprehensive with the right ingredients. Yeah. So in court, it recognizes that you can have a certificate, a medical certificate issued by the traditional healer. Mm. Of course, there are controls. And people say, well, my kishwa is sangoma, therefore they'll be abused. Who said that medical doctors, medical citizens are abuse. not abused? <laughs> How many people do you find in the doctor's consult on a Monday because they're looking for medical certificates? Many. People sell medical certificates. Yeah. And of course, the court does distinguish between a medical certificate and a medical report. People use medical certificates because it's easy. A few lines, he's sick, he's got flu, so he's off for three days. Mm -hmm. No questions asked, right? Mm -hmm. So in terms of traditional healing, in terms of the legislation I'm referring to, yeah. we ought to have created institutions of evaluation, such as the Health Professional Council, yeah. where all you know, traditional healers are registered for them to practice True. as traditional healers. Because there's a lot of people who wakes up in the morning, I don't know, headache, I ring your hand on your toes. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> yes, yes. Right? Or you have... Well, babies, I eat bad luck. It and then bad suddenly, luck. Yeah. something happened. I bang, bang, They bump me at the back. You don't save your car. It, die, it dies and you blame Uma Kelo and a Budiak lawyer. That's mm, not yeah, how it works. Yeah. Just save us the car. <laughs> yes. Right? <laughs> the real issue is that to create a credible institution that will have traditional doctors registered, mm. running proper practices, and be able to issue the relevant yeah. medical documents when you go to the workplace and say, this is from a traditional doctor, this is my certificate, mm -hmm. it must not be questions because of the author. What is, what is, what is the current status quo? Do we, one, you said, yes, you can produce one. 
Yes. You can present one at work. Yes. It's recognized. Yes. Unless by people who choose not to recognize That's it. That's correct. Which I'm sure still exists. Yes, yes. they do in, yeah. in big numbers. Uh -huh. That's exactly where their problem is sitting. Here's the, and, and the central issue for me, mm. right? The biggest, you know, part of, I'm studying my, my doctoral degree now in law, right? Yeah. In my PhD study, one of the chapters I evaluate in chapter two is the connection between the legislature and the judiciary. Mm -hmm. In South Africa, the problem that we have, a lot of judgments, good judgments that are made, don't end up in legislation. Ah. Let, let me explain the difference. The Kivitz Kuran judgment, which talks about the recognition of culture and traditions. In fact, the court was very strong to say that no one, has the right and power mm. to question the logic and rationality of traditional healing oh. and culture. Yeah. Make peace with it, right? So what does that mean? So when we make give its crown as a judgment, and it is what we call the judicial lawmaking powers of the courts, mm. it means when the court looks at the legislation and they interpret it, in the interpretation, they tell what it means and how it must apply. Mm. In some cases, they tell you that it's unlawful. They declare it to be unconstitutional. That exercise of court, when it does that, it's called the judicial lawmaking powers of the okay. court. It's the creativity of the court in the interpretation process to create law. It's, it's, it's process. It's process. Yeah. Because once a judgment is made, mm. it's not only binding to parties, it's binding to everyone. Mm. So they give its grand judgment is binding to everyone, especially that it comes from the highest court. What is missing mm. is the tunnel from judiciary to legislature. Yeah. To say that the customary act that we have that recognizes traditional healers does not make provision about what the court said. So somebody needs to transport that back to legislation mm. because the biggest gap that we have is that not everyone, as you're sitting here, David, you don't read law reports. No. You look at your Ubala constitution and said, oh, I have a right to equality. Mm. That's how far you go. Mm. But this judgment is made about what that right means. Mm. It's content and scope. True. Right? Because section 39 says this is how you interpret it. Section 36 tells you this is how it's limited in mm. content and scope. That's what happened with the death penalty. You know, people don't understand how, how it exactly happened. Mm. So, because it, they were challenging the, the criminal procedure. True. So, on the Kivitz Kron, I'm, I'm using this as, as a template. We ought to have developed mm policies at national level, including legislation, basic conditions like mm -hmm. the medical certificate issue, right? Yeah. To recognize it. That's one example That's of one example. many applications. There's, yes. In yeah. fact, there, there's a Makanya judgment. I like talking about that, that relates to the domestic workers. Mm -hmm. But just to elaborate on the point, this judgment was looking at COIDA, the Compensation of Disease and Injuries Act. Yeah. Did you know that that legislation expressly excluded domestic workers from enjoying protections uh, in terms of injuries and diseases hmm. since democracy sure all workers are protected in terms of of injuries and diseases at work mm. this case actually for you out of your interest this domestic worker works in this workplace there's a swimming pool mm. she falls into the swimming pool she can't swim she dies yeah then she wants to claim they say, no, you can't claim because COIDA does not protect domestic mm -hmm. workers. But mm -hmm. you're talking about an employee. Yes. When I checked the memorandum behind COIDA, even at the time of Jamal to check exactly what was the rationale for domestic workers to be excluded from the protection of mm. them, because that's social protection. True. I can't find it. And if you read paragraph one to five of the judgment, how the court is lambasting this issue, there's something they call the intersectional discrimination. But mm. in this case, said, how can it be that, and we know that most of the people are domestic workers are foreigners and it's women in the majority of cases. So many workers in the workplace, mm. even the, the domestics mm. that, we, mm. that we employ, yeah. could not claim. But mm. if you're injured and you worked as a petrol attendant, you work as a receptionist, you can, you can claim. claim, yeah. I mean, logically, without looking at law or being an expert in law, why does that make sense? Why, you know, how, did it, how did it make sense to anybody? It, it didn't. It was an oversight. It's an oversight. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if it's an, it's an oversight, you see, because an oversight <laughs> I can understand. Oversight. Yeah, because <laughs> when you craft legislation, yeah. right, and you choose to exclude certain people, that's not oversight. Yeah. That's decision. But that's, that, that's a law that exists in a democracy. 
in a democratic state, in a constitutionally protected state. Yo. Do you remember this case, Aga Kaili, mm. the sex worker case? Remi- remind it's us. It's the LAC, yeah. right? It's important that, that our listeners understand that. Yeah. And which elaborates on the same problem that I'm talking about. Even the discovery on that talks about foreign workers. But mm. let's look at the Kylie one. Mm. Kylie came into being because a sex worker claimed she's a worker. Okay. Came to the CCMA and said, well, I need my rights protected because I am a worker. Then somebody smart says, well, you are a prostitute. Mm-hmm. You are a sex worker. Therefore, there cannot be that you are an employee because your profession is unlawful. It is, okay. In law, I get a contract has certain general principles that mm. comes with it. Mm. Amongst those is lawfulness. So if prostitution is unlawful, so you can't conclude in employment law an effective and valid contract because of that. But that's one argument. Okay. But there's an interesting dimension, the difference between an employee and a worker. Mm. The court took the approach, the constitutional approach, that we're talking about workers here. The same applies with the foreign worker. You may not conclude that because you are undocumented or you are an illegal immigrant. But, but you remain a worker. But you remain a worker. Yeah. You are constitutionally protected. That's why discovery judgment and the Kali judgment, the court confirmed that, no, there are workers. Therefore, CCMA has jurisdiction. Ooh. That's how we ended up having jurisdiction. <laughs> so when you track... So interesting. It's interesting, yeah. right? That's, when you track then what happened since then, legislatively speaking, nothing has happened. Mm. It ended up in the law reports. Today, no one follows up the closing, de- closing the deal issue that now we know that a sex worker is a worker. How then do we continue to protect mm. rights and interests of this worker, including Occupational Health and Safety Act, Basic Conditions of Employment Act, Minimum Wage Act, all of those specific legislations yeah, yeah. because I'm a worker. But 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 does it, 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 in law, and this is very minimal knowledge of law, law gets to be exercised. Yes. Uh, once there's a case, like mm. the one you just made reference to, including yes. the traditional healer yes. uh, scenario. Yes. Until then, it's when a lawyer will make reference to that case. That's correct. That similar to such and such a case. That's correct. I can bring it. Doesn't that help to close the loop or, or or the loop has to be closed differently by, as you said, it must then be applied. Yes. And, yes. and applied almost physically to say, now here are the rules of engagement when it comes to a traditional healer in this regard. Law is not just for lawyers. Yeah. When citizens want to access law, they don't need to lo- read law reports. It must be simplified and it must be accessible. And they don't have to get lawyers. They don't have to get lawyers to understand that unfair dismissal, I have a right to refer to the CCMA. I don't need to pay you to tell me that. When I read the Labor Relations Act and I read Section 186 and I read Section 185, Mm. I must understand what that means without having to refer to any lawyer. Because a society that has rights but do not know they exist, they cannot exercise them. Mm. We are poor in education, right? Because if then we have all the... South Africa, you know, employment law runs mainly on four legislations. Yeah. It's the Labor Relations Act, which I call the parent, mm-hmm. right? Because all of these emanate from that. It's what, what, what governs even your job. That's what yeah. creates who your, we are. Yes. CCMA is created in terms of the Labor Relations yeah. Act, right? If you want to understand what dismissal means, you don't look at the occupational health and safety. Mm-hmm. You go to the Labor Relations Act. If yeah. you want to claim work injuries, you don't go to the LRA, you, you go, to, go the, to, you. to the compensation. Yes. And we've created an institution called the Compensation Fund yeah. that deals with compensations which people contribute to that if you get injured, you go there. That's it. So it is mainly the Labor Relations Act is the basic conditions. It is the um, employment equity is the national minimum wage. Mm. You've got others that are important, like like I said, the occupational health and safety and the compensation, the corridor, sure. because if you get injured. but. If you look at the usage, mm. it's mainly these four yeah. that are running. If we do not educate about them, how they relate, and how they work in practice, then you will not enjoy the protection it's offering. Mm-hmm. You have to know that content. Training has become expensive. That's mm. why CCMA exists, because most of the training you provide is for free. Many institutions provide training at an expensive price. Yeah. So if you have someone who is a petrol attendant, 
who is earning below the minimum wage. How do they know that the employer is violating the law? Mm. But they have to know first. But to know, they have to be taught. The same thing happens with our constitution. Our constitution, they call it the best in the world. I'm not sure why we're saying that, mm. right? It, it, for me, the, the jury is still out about <laughs> yes. that, right? Why do we, well, we'll get to that. Yes, we'll let get me to let that. you complete that, your yes. thought. So the important thing is that let us put an effort to say, so David has been dismissed, mm. right? So you say, okay, I'm dismissed. Where do I work? I work Kosho Bright. Mm. Is there a bargaining council that exists in short that deals with that industry? You go and refer, refer there. If there's no industry, it's, you end up at the CCMA, yeah. right? So I'm um, so how long does it take for me to do so? Because people must understand when you're dismissed, you can't just sit back and say, well, after three years, by the way, mm, and then it's three years down the line, how feel about well your case is prescribed? You say, prescribed? What, what does, does prescribed that mean? mean? Yeah. There's a difference between prescription and condonation. Yeah. But lawyers flourish in that. But a petrol attendant, a domestic worker, a construction worker, a receptionist, need to just open the LRA and say, okay, here's the content list. This is unfair dismissal. Mm. So dismissal means termination with or without notice, mm. or I can be constructively dismissed, or it could be misconduct, or it can be any of those. True. So what has happened to me? Well, they told me that I performed badly and, and they dismissed it. Oh, that's poor performance issue, mm. right? So it doesn't have to be complex. There has to be simplicity in yeah. drafting of legislation for us to access it so that you read it without it being interpreted to you, True. right? So that is important. So the educational component of us is lacking. Therefore, you find that there's thousands of cases of persons with good cases. Mm. They don't winnable, prosec cases. winnable cases. Yeah. They don't prosecute them because they don't know. Where do we miss it? Because the way you, you, you tell it, it, some of the information is very basic. Yes. Uh, it, uh, and, and we could introduce them much, much earlier in the life of a, of a South African. Yes. At a, at, a, at a school level even. Correct. Uh, because once you, you lose it at that school level in a formal you know, environment, you almost will lose it forever, which is what happens to us now. That's correct. If it's not introduced in primary school and high school, at varsity, we head in different directions and it's gone forever. Mm. If you had to make a decision about when and how it's introduced to us, where would you introduce it? At school level. Yeah. There's something I used to do uh, at, at the library, but it was, it was not at the school. Mm. And I understood that some of the schools started to practice. I used to study street law. They used to call it that, right? It's simple, basic law mm. to understand that what does theft mean? Mm. It means that you stole something, right? Using simple term, mm -hmm. it's against the law. When caught, you're going to jail, and jail you might do time, and in due time, it's unpleasant. Mm -hmm. So it has that preventative content of it, but it also educates you because you can yeah. teach someone else about what theft is. Divorce. What is divorce? Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, divorce is created by legislation. Right? There's a legislation that called the Marriage Act that creates marriages. There's marriages in common law and all of that. Mm -hmm. Right? So if I say I'm married, what does it mean? The same thing with engagement. Is that I promise to marry you and I don't marry you. Is that legally Can binding? I just resign yes. from that agreement? No, you can't. It's called the breach of contract. Yes. In fact, go cast they call it the breach of promise. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's still acceptable yes. because you are still breaching a promise. But in legal parlance, it's a breach of contract because the moment I offer, Mm. to marry you, you accept, a contract is formed. Whether written or not. Let me explain. The same applies, David, with the contract of employment. Mm. The fact that a contract of employment is not written doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It exists. The only difference is evidence. Ah. Contract is evidential. It's a memorial that shows it exists and the terms that are because if we debate mm. or argue about what I earn, your payslip and your contract is the only document that can help for us to resolve the true, dispute true. about whether they are paying minimum wage or not. So you still have employees today, today, mm. right? Two decades after democracy, who are still paid per envelope. Sure. That has no other detail other than name, ID, and what you're paid, mm. right? There's nothing else, but there are other things. There's other things of deduction, there's of pension fund, and all of them which are not applicable, mm. right? If you go to school, you introduce legal subject because if I'm interested in IT, right? 
I learned computers when I finished my trick. We never had it at school. Like most of us. Like you know yes. that, right? <laughs> and then it, you now develop a phobia about computers when mm. you, you are supposed to be flowing from God's game. Yeah. The same applies with law. The history that is taught, it must be taught the same way you should be teaching law. Mm. Different subject, but at very low level, not in the manner that creates litigators, mm. but for us to know. What is even interesting about that, David, is that as you learn that law, you are able to teach parents about basics of law while you are still at school. Mm -hmm. In terms of career guidance also, you are able to choose your profession at school level. Yeah. You see, this perception that if you're going to be a lawyer, you must study history. I don't know what <laughs> <laughs> That's what man. they used to tell us. Yeah. <laughs> and while well, beeps, you know, biblical yeah, studies and all of that. That's exactly <laughs> what I thought when yeah. you said history. I thought beeps was also included. Beeps was in also part of that equation. And it doesn't apply. No, it doesn't apply. Yeah. So you can do a same level mm. of subjects of law at that level. So when I leave school, my choice is clear. I can then go study law at the more advanced level. There's no shocking issue. No. You go there and say, this is substantive law. This is the law of evidence. This is interpretation of statutes. Mm. Law of contracts. <laughs> and what is even more interesting, part of my doctorate, is to talk about the impact of language and culture on dispute resolution. You can resolve many disputes provided you use the right language, but respect culture that comes with it. You know, I once did a case of um, a very old man was dismissed just before pension, right? And as we set down the case, we brought a young girl commissioner and he said that he never spoke. Mm, the and, old man. Yeah. yeah. And he said, why would you bring a young girl to discuss my issues? In my culture, that's wrong. Mm. And I'm not going to proceed until you bring someone who'll do that. In fact, if you remember the story, the former president, the late Kholesasa Mandela, when he had issues with Winnie at the time mm -hmm. and the divorces and everything else, you remember the stompy issues yes. and all of that. A young journalist asked him about whether he's divorcing Winnie or not. I don't even remember his response was, oh. you are too young to ask me that question. Sure. <laughs> That's culture. True. Right there. The same happens in the dispute resolution process. If you are charged with sexual harassment and you bring a young girl to do that case as a commissioner. People have issue with that. In fact, Americana, the case Americana, the former director mm -hmm. right, of the CCMA, as they were trying to resolve the dispute, they tried to go to the copy to try to get you know, workers and try to resolve mm -hmm. the dispute and everything else. They told us, no, you can't. We don't need women here. <laughs> we don't need women to come here because Tina Sambani Nyanga and everything else, yes. and you bring a woman. So there's whether you can't question his rationality. No. It's culture. Which is what even the uh, the Concord said. You can't question you can't the re rationality. Rationality and reasonableness yeah. of a culture and tradition of people. You mm. recognize it, it exists. So the same subject of at school, I will be very happy mm. if we introduce that subject at school level. It's basic law. It's basic, basic law. Yeah. We can produce best litigators. Yeah. Because you know, Goskele, even at the time, we used to do debate. True. But look at the content of the subject we chose mm. at school. It's not the kind of subject you would choose which I have legal content. No. They tested your ling linguistics, but not the substance of the subject that you're talking about. But imagine if we do world research subject at school level. Yeah. Guess what you could become when you get to university. And what I like about this is you're not trying to get people to be lawyers. No. You're trying to get them to understand the law. To understand and it the goes law. back to a point you said, l law is not for lawyers. No. Because we interact with the law as common everyday people. We interact with the law on a daily basis. Yes. The minute you wake up in the morning, you engage with the law in some way. Yes. If your, your plug uh, it, it kills you, you engage. You need to engage with the law for what happened and what are the results, what are the repercussions, who is who is wrong, who's right. So yeah. law is a part of our our everyday life. It's 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 everywhere. Yeah. As we are sitting here talking, law is in action. Yes. What we say is law. True. Because I can't be defamatory against any person because you gave me the platform, mm -hmm. right? Because somebody listens to he's defaming me. That's a legal issue. Yes. Right? <laughs> you are here 
you have a company. It's regulated by the Companies Act. That's it. Right? Yes. If I look at it and say, oh, it's a CC, it's a close corporation, there's a yeah. pretty one. Oh, in my mind, the law is running. But mm. not everyone does that because they think law is only for lawyers. Mm. It's not like that. The importance of knowing law is that whenever there's a breach of any of your interests and rights, you know that it's actionable. True. You know when to take action. And what to do. And what to do and where to go. Yeah. The same thing happens with employment law. If you get injured, you know that, oh, my employer is supposed to be contributing, therefore I must go to the compensation fund. Mm. I don't have to argue and interpret what it means, but I know I'm injured at work and therefore I must go. You see, the interesting thing about knowing that law, David, is that COVID-19 ushered a new environment mm. called remote working. But we did not do just transition from that to what we are now. Mm. And I always joke about this and I say to myself, so if you work remotely, and traditionally we know a workplace to be a building, mm. there we're sitting, that's where we're working, right? But if I work remotely and I am at home, what then constitutes a workplace? Mm. Will you say my home is a workplace? Has it changed? Has it changed? Yeah. Therefore, the next question is, if I get injured while cooking, but working remotely, where can I claim Fish. compensation because I'm <laughs> you, you injured You have to solve this one for us. <laughs> <laughs> you have to solve, because I bet you someone will say, well, that's an interesting one. What are, can I claim? Well, there's no law <laughs> providing for it. Not moment. right now. No, there's not even any case since, you know, COVID-19. Yeah. That said, somebody got injured at Toma Chiswaki fish oil, while during working hours? During working hours, because you're working remotely on our computer, what? on our data, yes. during our working hours, yes. but you're at home. But policy, you see, there are other things that we transitioned to remote working without creating policy. True. I'm telling you now, the biggest void is policy formulation based on the change. That has happened. That has happened. Therefore, if I get injured while at home, I mean, you saw that EFF case, somebody said, oh, Tariq is Fuba, and then they see him in the EFF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, <laughs> that recent one. Yeah. It was in the March and yeah, didn't go to yeah. work. And they say, you're good, if you're good enough to see him, you're good enough to be at work. True. But the question, when am I at work? If then I was working remotely in the same scenario, mm. right? I sent an email yeah. just before, while on, I was on marching. The, on your phone. While I was marching. On your phone, <laughs> yes. right? The fact that I'm sick, it doesn't mean that I'm unable to work. Yes. That's not what it means. I could be sitting in the co in that same conference, sitting there, well, I approve. This is this is my system. Like we have our mm. sign flow. There's a claim. Oh, I approve that. Click done. I'm yeah. at work. And you're the in a conference. The fact that I'm sitting in a conference doesn't mean that I'm at work. <laughs> There's a lot of debate, but Whew. the void is creating Huge. policy for us to be able to say, this is the new meaning of workplace. But let me tell you something interesting. The debate about what workplace means did not even start with that. Mm. Even before that, we still had problems about what workplace okay. means. For example? For example, if you have more than one building, mm. so we sit here, there's a branch sitting in Santin, okay. there's a branch sitting in Heidelberg, mm. and all workers are there. So what does workplace mean? Does it mean just here? If we've got offices sitting in overseas, but it's still the same company, mm. would that still constitute a workplace? So if I'm a union member wanting to organize and, and recruit members, mm. Can I recruit those that are outside where we are, who are sitting in Centen, for example? <laughs> yes. Right? That, that's important. So if I'm a driver, I'm a truck driver, mm. right? And you call my workplace, what? Is it where the depot where I come from or in my truck as I as drive? As I'm because, driving. Because if I get injured while driving. I'm at work. I'm at work. Yes. There are different sectors and industries that exist where you do not have a one size fit all definition of, a of what constitutes the workplace. Yeah. We don't know the ingredients of that. And by the way, workplace is not entirely dependent on geography. Hmm. Because if it was geography, then the meaning will change again. Let's take sex, sex workers, the example that we spoke yeah. about earlier on. Yeah. Where will the workplace of a sex worker be? Is, is it, it in the, the street? Or in the street? <laughs> yes. So when she's standing there soliciting, that's her workplace. Mm. If she gets injured soliciting clients while at work, because the court recognizes their working relationship, not mm. necessarily concrete, that makes it a worker. So therefore it means I am protected. So you see how fluid <sighs> the meaning of, of workplace. a workplace. Yeah. But if I were to urge is to create the universal framework and certain guidelines 
of what should constitute workplace because a lot depends on it, not just mm. about issues of injury mm. also. It's also about issues of earning income, like the EFF issue uh, that we spoke about. Yeah. If the person can show, I did work, I have targets. Mm. I don't work about where I should be. I'm working on targets, right? I understand that you are there in a sick leave, so you shouldn't be working. Shouldn't be working, right? Yeah. I understand that. You should, we assume you sh you're, you're, you're sick, you should be home, nursing your sickness. And who said it must be like that? Yeah. <laughs> so if I'm sick and I decide to drive with my family to wherever we're going, am I breaching my sick leave? Mm -hmm. So there isn't a definition of conduct Related when to a sick sick leave. Yes, yes, sick sick leave. Yes. Yeah. Because if I've got flu, right, and I'm, I've got three days sick leave, mm. on the first two days after in getting antibiotics and I'm feeling well and strong, do I have an obligation to go back to work? Because the medical certificate said four days on two days, get sharp. Mm. So even the other two days, I decide to work while on sick leave. Am I breaching any rule? Mm. For example, could I be charged for working during sick leave <laughs> are there any specific prohibited activities i am not supposed to do what does the law say there isn't jeez <laughs> it doesn't tell you what you shouldn't be doing <coughs> all it does is that you are sick you must be granted leave to recover because sick leave is about recuperation it's about being ill and be given an opportunity to recuperate when you get medication you sleep you must recuperate so mm. that you are fit enough to go back to that's why when you read the medical certificate it doesn't say go. You you must go back to work. It says you are fit to resume duty. Mm. The fitness is an, an important issue. So if I'm fit to mm. work, but before the the leave ends, why is it wrong to do so? Wow. If I'm able to execute mm. that while sitting in a strip club, would I be charged for that? The the, the issue of, of of sex work, um, what we missed, like in many judgments, mm. it's policy formulation to say that if then there are workers, and I see now that the Department of Justice has initiated uh, the process of legalizing sex work, right? Which will then largely then sort out the issue, yeah. which then effectively mean that a sex worker should be treated like any other worker for that matter. True. But the, the challenge of workplace is not just associated with them, it's everywhere, mm. right? But what is important, the principle here, is the same with the traditional healers. Once we create the law, the, the, the courts make a you decision. Have to apply it. Let's apply it and transfer that straight into legislation. Yeah. To say that the court has held this, so let's amend. The same thing with the assigned judgment that talks about labor brokers, right? There was a big thing about when we're talking about a deemed employee, what does it mean? Mm, there mm. was no meaning anywhere. Huh. And then until it ended up at the constitutional court, went to the LAC up to the, the Labour Appeal Court into the Constitutional Court, and the court did explain it. Yeah. But nothing happens beyond that. It just, right? it was explained. It was explained. And that's it. And the problem with that, David, is that people will get to re-refer matters that are settled trying to create a precedent that is already created. Hmm. There are certain disputes that should not come because you... There is... There's it's case law, you know, so to speak. All yes. you need to know is, is to take from the judgment, together with the legislation that is interpreted, you transfer that into policy. Yeah. The same issue with that worker, uh, you know, who attended the EFF issue. When it comes to the issue relating to sick leave, mm. there are Im important questions that we need to ask yeah. that I've raised, that what you are not supposed to do, not what you are not able to do during sick leave, because I think that debate is important. Uh, this poor guy uh, is is does he have a winnable case? <laughs> There's always a winnable case uh, in any, <laughs> any matter. scenario. In is any a winnable scenario, case, it depends yeah. on where it is and depends on the judges, yeah. right? But you always talk prospects. I, I was quite keen to see papers how it was argued, mm. if mm. at all, right? To see how really it was argued the issue of a sick leave, because for me, from legal reform point of view. We must sort that issue out. Yeah. That if Kiri Oko sick leafing, this is what you're... Let me give a very good example. When you're on annual leave, mm. and our law is very simple, is you have one employer. You cannot, without permission, then undertake other work. While you're you, on... While you're 
on your, annual leave. On your annual leave because you've got time, mm. right? It doesn't permit you to do so. So there are principles there that you can refer to that tells what you can or cannot do. Mm. But sick leave, basically you're sick, but you're not in ICU. And at some point while on sick leave, I'm able to work. How many workers you can ask today who are even made to do certain things while, while they are on sick leave? Yes. But you don't get charged because it's in the interest of employment. Mm -hmm. But now we've got this scenario. Somebody who said he's on sick leave. I mean, I'm imagining if I was representing him and I said, well, they said if I'm good enough to sing and be in the conference, I should be fit enough to work. So what does the medical certificate say? Mm. Because that's to me the starting point. That at the time when I went there, I was fit. I was fine. Mm. But my medical certificate says I'll be back only in two days' time. So which rule did I breach? Yes. Uh. Is it misconduct? What? You see, in employment law, you cannot charge me unless you tell me what rule did I breach. True. The rule must exist. Mm. I must know what the rule is. Does it exist? Yeah, and it must be reasonable and it must be, you know, yeah. it must have been applied, it must have been consistently applied so that when I do wrong, I must know I'm doing wrong because the rule exists. In in the case of this EFF guy, does that rule exist? No. Yeah. That you should not go anywhere else because you're sick. You should be homebound where, in where, bed. Does, where does it say that, <laughs> I, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the judgment says so, right? <laughs> but, but in law, when a judgment is made, we follow it. Mm. Unless you appeal it. You want to contest it. And you contest it. So, but no, but this finding is not fair. Mm. To me, when it says sick leave, it does not mean I'm stuck at home. I, I am prohibited from doing any other thing. That's it. It's recuperation. It's inability to work, which the judgment is correct. It's inability to work because I'm sick. But in that period, mm. if I am able to work, even though I am on sick leave, and even if I choose not to work, but I'm fit to work, but I do something else, which ordinarily I shouldn't be doing because I'm in, in sick leave, mm. what rule am I breaching? Which <laughs> rule on sick leave am I breaching? Yeah. It's my sick leave. I'm the one who's sick. I'm expected to be at home. But where are we saying you should be at <laughs> home or hospitalized and we are disabled from doing other things? How do we measure? Mm, that I'm not I'm able to, to do that. Let's put the, 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 the conference issue aside. Mm. I'm at home. I feel fit. I start doing garden. I'm washing cars. And I do walk. I do all these other things. Am but, I breaching a specific But rule? I'm not allowed to, to go sing. To go sing. I could be singing in the house, mm. not in the conference. Sing at home, top of my voice. Am I preaching the same rule of the conference rule yeah, or not? Or it depends where you're singing. Or it depends on where you're singing, right? <laughs> For me, is we must not be afraid to question things. Mm. We must not be afraid to reason. That in what I say, then, because you are the lawyer or you are the judge, you feel offended because I'm raising the question. No. Mm. Take what I'm saying and say, but is there a gap in law that should do this? Even if you put the law aside. Let's just talk simple policy. Because mm. for me, the simplest way is policy. You can create policy in the workplace yeah. that when you're in sick leave, you are not allowed to attend public events. You're not allowed to sing. You're not allowed to exercise. But there must be reasonability. There must be rationality. It must be lawful also what, mm. you're, what you're prescribing. Because at the end of the day, being sick and being granted sick leave, you are unfit to work. Mm. It's not a prohibition to do mm -mm. things. How do we interpret that? How do we bring in the prohibition content of it? Sure. Right? And to me, this is where my trouble is sitting. But it's a lacuna, it's a gap that we have in law which we must close, but at least at policy level. It, it, it sounds like um, society is moving faster than legislature. Yes. Much, much faster. Yes. And legislature, because we always, we have this perception that the law takes its time. Yes. But it has to really catch up because there's yes. a lot that's happening and the law is not catching up. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. In fact, in the context of what we call in South Africa the fourth industrial revolution um, and, and globally, um, a lot has happened. The issue of remote work, we did it because we were forced by COVID. True. But it ought to have been an ordinary decision that we make. Mm. Before COVID, we were doing our interviews and everything else online. You just use Zoom or you use Microsoft Teams. Mm. That's evolution, even if at a small scale, right? But our legislation needs to keep up with that change. True. I'll give an example. The other time I raised a question about what we call a 
social media protest, right? Or, 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 or online picketing. Mm -hmm. We know picketing of people standing in the street carrying True. placards. Yeah. You're protesting. But social media allows that. I can send a WhatsApp now to everybody and said, tools down. Mm. Or do this, the employer sign, and do all of the. That's part of that. Or anything you would write on a placard, I put it on WhatsApp. So it's now recognized as picketing. It is technically it is, yeah. but the act does not know it online picketing. Ah. <laughs> so the act hasn't moved with no, the time. I'm trying to show you the evolution, the very question you're asking. Yeah. Is that we need to keep up with that. Sure. Right? The same issue that we're talking about now, that the workplace issue, that I can work remotely. I can most of the things you can do it online. It doesn't have to include physical presence and mm, physical doing. Mm. Including picketing. Including picketing. Yeah. Let's talk about the strike, for example. If you look at the definition of what the strike means, and its meaning, it was since 1995, mm. right? That's how it is. It has not changed its meaning since then. So it's a work stoppage. It's about issues relating to partial or full retardation of work mm -hmm. in pursuit of a matters of mutual interest, such as wages and all of that, True. right? We understand that. So if you ask people, what is a strike? They'll tell you the stri strike as we know it. People stop working, they sing, they go into the streets and do all those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. But the essence of a strike is about retardation of work, mm -hmm. right? So if then we're working remotely and we want to go on strike. How do we do it? How do you do it? But if you go to the definition, it's tools down. It's tools down. It means down. We, 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 we disable the working work. process. You're yes. retarding work. Exactly. So in other words, if I shut down my data mm. or switch off my computer, I don't get emails, I don't submit reports because I am aggrieved mm. in pursuit of a demand. I'm on strike. I'm on strike, but I don't need to be in the streets. Yeah. And if that is the case, can one person strike? No. <laughs> that, but according, see, according to the current definition, yes, one person cannot one, strike. But in so what do we need to do? So I mobilize. Mm. I just need you. Fetch. I'm not happy with this thing. Are you are also aggrieved? Yes. Yes. So let's go on strike, right? There's dynamics. Mm. There's other things. What makes the protected unprotected strike? True. But the point I'm trying to drive at is because of the transition, because of evolution, law needs to evolve with the time also. Mm. Otherwise, it becomes irrelevant. You find these gaps that arise now sure. because it doesn't keep up with the change. Mm. The same thing happens with the meaning of work. For example, when you say waspan, people mm. think you are employed and you're working, you get a salary. Mm. But there's many new forms of employment that are, has arisen. Okay. When you're talking about these industrial revolutions, there's many books that tells you this is the end of work if you're talking for IR. Mm. You're introducing automation, you're introducing artificial intelligence, you are introducing gig economy. Mm -hmm. So you don't work in the traditional sense of employment, mm. but you get paid for time and output. Mm. It's called gigging, a gig. That's mm. why, you know, normally people in the public space will say, hey, can I gig? Mm. Can I gig? It's an independent contractor. Yeah. I can have more than one employer inverted commas, but I'm at work, I am contracted. I'm not an employee where I must have one, I'm a seven, I may have one employee. True. So if that's the evolution and that's how things are happening, so the traditional way and meaning of what constitute has employment has changed. Yeah. We need to adapt to it. The workplace has adapted. The meaning of employment has adapted. Let's talk about the issues of automation. Many things that are traditionally done by people physically are not done by machines. It takes away work, right? Mm. But that revolution is not just about taking work, but it's creating new forms of employment. That's right? true. In other words, I need to evolve and be more technically savvy on the new type of work that we're talking about. So if I was printing T-shirts here using my hands, but there's a machine, so if I were to be trained and retrained for me to be able to keep employment, I must do better what the machine is doing mm -hmm. or supplement what the machine is doing. That's true. So issues of 4 IR is not so much about automations or the robotics. It's also about attitude. It's mm -hmm. also about mentality. It's also about ways and methods of doing things. Yeah. Yes, it's true. There are many employments that are going to be lost because of that. But some but it's going would to create argue others. that they'll create 
new opportunities. But in a different form. Yeah. But as all of that happens, how many statutes or need legislations to be created are changing in relation to this? Let's talk about collective bargaining. Yeah. The, because that's a very interesting example, other than issues of strike. Look, you, you see, when you're talking about in the workplace or you're talking about union recruitment, it's still the old way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So I come to you, join the union, why? We'll represent you, get dismissed, and if you want to change your, your terms of employment, then we will we'll, we'll do that yeah. for you. We'll, so, find, we'll fight collectively for better salary, and yes. working environment, yes. all of that. But how do you recruit today? Mm. Do we still do that old way of walking to you and trying to explain to you? No, we use social media. Yeah. You recruit using social media. You can go to Instagrams, you can go to, you can use WhatsApps, you can use all of it to recruit. Mm. Secondly, your market that you're recruiting must be technologically savvy for them to find you there, mm. right? They must be using the same catch and the same platform that you are using. That's true. The age of those you recruit also changes because the employment age becomes younger and more educated and more technologically savvy. Mm. So the strategy on how you, um, you recruit must evolve. Mm. Who you recruit also evolves. When you recruit, you recruit yeah. also evolves. And most importantly, the service that you provide, right? Mm. So it's important to educate a union official, an employer's organization, how to negotiate because mm. negotiations is a skill. Mm. How to represent, it's a skill. But we're using different platforms now. You can do a case online. So if you can't use computers and all of that during COVID, you could not represent. Mm. So who you recruit, therefore, these days, it changes. So you've got to evolve with it. There's an interesting principle, which is part of the research I do, called ICT-based collective bargaining, mm -hmm. right? What it means is that to what extent is technology influencing how we bargain, mm. for what we bargain for? So if during COVID, you were earning 10 rand, and from that 10 rand, it ends up being 6 rand because of cost associated with the transport, petrol, clothes, food, and everything else. But if I work online, the money is safe. Would you regard that as salary increment? Mm. Because I save you costs. If you negotiate increment, do I take that into account or don't I? Mm. Right? So the type of work we have, which is no longer the traditional methods, there's gigs, there's independent contractors. Shouldn't we then revise who a union can recruit in terms of social protection and protection of rights? Because it still work, right? How, therefore, you service members, which platforms you use, that has also changed. Mm -hmm. So you need to evolve. So I'm not sure how many constitutions, <laughs> how many policies of unions are changing in order to adapt yeah. to the new environment to find a new type of worker that we are talking about. Because there isn't a union that protects independent contractors. It's only the traditional workers that we're talking about. So who protects that category I've been employment? I've been an independent worker most of my adult life because of SABC. Yes. Uh, on, uh, on air staff, we are independent workers. Uh, we don't belong to any union. So technically, we You're are on we, we're on our own, literally. Yes. And, yes. and uh, uh, there's always been talks that we should try it, we should do it. Uh, but you know, when you become a, a unionist, uh, you, there's always the danger of now alienating yourself from your employer. Mm. And come end of the year, your contract doesn't get renewed. Then you're, you're not lost to the system. You're no longer able to fight that fight because you're no longer employed. So it's always a tricky one. But let, let's go back to the points you've been making. What is the role of the CCMA in, this, in all these loopholes? Is it to flag them? or to wait for cases to come your way, uh, where does the CCMA play a role in these gaps that, that we, we, we're highlighting now? The, there's, there's two main ones. The first one is education. Mm. We, we, we have a very good training component of what we do. But the best one is deciding cases based on those loopholes because we get to experience them. So if you come there and say, well, I am not being paid a minimum wage, but my employer says because I sleep at the workplace, because I eat at the workplace, mm -hmm. therefore it makes up for the amount I need to be paid as a minimum wage. Mm -hmm. So if you feel aggrieved by that, because those dynamics are not necessarily provided for, you know, there's an attempt to do so, then you come to the system and say, well, my employer says 
there are other means that supplement what I get. They give me uniform. They say, therefore, I mustn't be paid to. That's not correct. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to us, we then interpret that, right? We just, okay, the minimum wage says this is what is allowed, this is not what is not allowed. Mm -hmm. And then we issue an award, like a judgment. Mm -hmm. If then the employer is not happy with it, it goes to court. And then from court, labor court, it can go to the labor appeal court, it can end up in the constitutional court because many cases end up there. Mm -hmm. And that's when the law is created. But it started where? At the CCMA. Yeah. But there's a process before that. An employee must know that that is a fight to fight. That's it. That's why I talk about education, about awareness, because that's important. So when minimum wage started, we did a lot of campaigns together with the Department of Employment and Labor to educate workers about who qualifies for the national minimum wage and what is the national minimum wage. And if there's a dispute, what do you do? What is the role of inspectors mm -hmm. when they come to workplace? Interestingly, in that, uh, the role that we, we should be playing also is creating effective partnerships. Because we're an entity of the department, and when inspectors go and inspect places whether they actually comply with legislation, mm -hmm. they issue compliance orders. And the law was amended that if the compliance order is issued and there's no compliance, you can bring it to the, to the CCMA for it to become an award. If they still not comply, you take that and go to the labor court, mm -hmm. right? So partnerships are important um, with the courts as well, because the work that we do also is not so much about enforcement of existing rights, that when there's a dispute, you can engage, mm -hmm. you can mediate. The biggest part of what we do is to mediate. Right? So mediations, there is no award. An outcome of that is a settlement. If there's a dispute that's not agreed, then an award is the outcome, yeah. which is then challenging in court. So put simply, one, we need to maximize on education and training. That's very important. At the workplace, at, starting from school, pre-work, mm -hmm. at work, all the way. Mm -hmm. That's education, right? Number two, we need to adopt strategies to prevent disputes. And one way of presenting, di preventing disputes is by education also. You educate people that this type of dispute you can't refer to. Because our caseload keeps increasing. I mean, we started at about 64,000 cases and when the CCMA started in 1996. And we added up close to 200,000 cases per annum at the sure. CCMA currently. That's what you're sitting on. Yeah. And it shows you the conflictual nature of the environment. And that excludes caseloads in the bargaining councils, mm -hmm. by the way. Mm -hmm. Because bargaining councils have their own cases as mm -hmm. well that are there, which are specialized in sectors and industries. Right? So when you're dispute prevention and dispute management strategies and tactics are effective, mm. especially at workplace levels, it will also manage the type of disputes that come to the CCMA. True. Right? So that's very important. So at workplaces, we educate, we know about rights, what you can fight, what you can't fight about. If it comes to us, in fact, interestingly, the Employment Equity Act, Section 10, has created an additional requirement that before you refer a, an unfair discrimination case, you must have attempted to resolve it first at work, mm -hmm. at the workplace. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a prevention strategy that you have, but it's not sitting in the different legislations. It's only happening in the Labor Relations Act. Mm -hmm. So our role is to educate about existing rights. Secondly, to prevent disputes or assist for disputes to be prevented. And also we are the initiation stage of cases for settlement that goes to the courts, mm -hmm. right? That ends up even at the constitutional court. At the constitutional court, court yeah. and many it's a Duma judgment, other judgment, they end up at the constitutional court. So other than that, we also participate as part of the department on in legal reform. Mm -hmm. It's not as, as much as I wish it to be. Because you see what is interesting, David, is that when law is created, CCMA is actually the executioner mm -hmm. of that legislation. Mm -hmm. Because that's where the the, the playground is. The, the, the interpretation happens. And application is, of that law yeah. is at that stage. We're executing the law, mm. right? So that's our role, testing its existence. But there's something big that is missing there. We do not have instruments that we use to test effectiveness of legislation we make. Mm. We legislate, we move on. We come back, we amend because there's new problems. True. But we need to, at some point, stop and say, well, CCMA, since we started national minimum wage in the past few years, how many cases have you had this? What type of disputes do you get relating to national minimum wage? Mm. It's this one. 
what's your success rate in enforcing those national minimum wage issues? Mm -hmm. These are the cases. So if we were to relook at the national minimum wage now, which gaps did you find? Yeah. That's the best place to do it. It's almost like stress testing. It is. The very legislature that's... It is. Yeah. Because then it tells you about which gap exists on the current legislation. Yeah. And also, even if there are no gaps, potential issues that arose during the course of us dealing with cases. Because mm. there's a lot of stories that we don't tell that are not contained in awards. Mm. And there is no other platform where you tell that story. Right? Even some of the examples that I gave is that Mdum Dala does not want you know, um, I, a young girl to address yes, their issue. Yeah. Yes. You know, there was a judgment that uh, Judge Edith Tratalimaje made about, about you know, issues of harassment once. Mm. And he said that in the judgment that the CCMA must adopt a new approach on how you handle sexual harassment cases or harassment cases. Why is that? The sensitivity of ah. it. Let me give an example. So if I'm a woman and I feel harassed, by the way, men get harassed as well. True. But yeah. people punish you if you say that. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. Right? The same thing as rape. Men get raped as well. Yeah. People find it strange, but it's true. Right? G GBV applies for both GBV genders. GBV applies to, to, to both because yeah. there's serious abuse. It depends on finance, power, positions, the number of factors that That's come true. through. And it's wrong for us not to discuss it because yeah. then you are perpetuating it. Mm. Right? So if then it happens that somebody has been harassed, and they tried to resolve it where it didn't. They are still scarred. And I'm talking about cases that actually happened. Mm. Because, David, there are cases that are fabricated. Hmm. There are cases that are called harassments when they are not for other reasons. Okay. Right? There was an attempt on me in the past yeah, when people yeah, yeah. tried to do that. But fortunately, people somehow, their godly spirit, uh, you know, made mm. them to tell the truth, mm. which was a good <laughs> thing, right? Yeah. But, but not everybody gets that. Not, no, no, yeah. no. It's very, very rare for yeah. that to happen, right? Sometimes it's, it's, it's contestation of power. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's jealousy and all kinds of things. Other people, it's because they've got serious personal issues. So mm -hmm. what that judgment meant is that when somebody comes and refer a case, and this is what listeners need to know and understand, yeah. is that harassment, including sexual harassment, either male or female, must be handled with care. It's not an ordinary case. Mm. It's not, right? It's one of those seriously, uh, or serious issues that are seriously guarded. So when somebody comes to the CCMA, all they carry is hope of resolution. True. They are expecting justice, right? So they come there, and you know what is even more interesting, David, is that when you're dealing with harassment cases, you're dealing with discrimination cases, the relationship between the parties still exists. It's not like unfair dismissal. Mm -hmm. You cannot treat it like, you know, as if it is that. You need that sensitivity. So when somebody comes, they sit there and they start telling the story, they start breaking down, right? You need to be sensitive to that. You need to be accommodating there, right? And therefore, we need to create a system and platforms that accommodates that sensitivity mm -hmm. of harassment not to retry or not to cause the same damage, but in a different form. That's true. Right? So how we ask questions, how we engage on a victim becomes important. You know, part of the subjects I studied in, in law is, is criminology. And, and sometimes they talk about the principle of precipitation, meaning that it's a victim creating their own victimization, right? You need to distinguish fabrication, that issues of victimology that I'm talking about, and real cases where harassment happened. It's mm. difficult to mm. do so. Mm. But irrespective of how it happened, sensitivity is, key. is critical. Yeah. How you address the person who suffered that is absolutely important. And that's the, that's the work you have to do as a that's CCMA. That's what we do. Yeah. Yes, that's what we do. And, yeah. But we must teach workplaces because when the act says you must try to resolve it at the workplace, if then your line manager is the harasser, Ooh. how do I engage with him to resolve the dispute? Yeah. What systems exist to accommodate that dimension, right? So when it comes to the CCMA, the same person still comes as well. Because if I'm an aggressor mm. and I come there, the first thing I, I say, because the, a workplace or an employer has an obligation to prevent and act on harassment. 
Otherwise, there's issues of liability if you fail to do so. So if I come there to defend harassment, mm. people include aggression as a way of defending, mm. using offense as a defensive strategy, mm. but not realizing you're causing further damage. True. You still go back to the workplace with the same people in the same workplace, mm. even if she lost the case, but there has to be an additional layer that we create between us and workplaces to ensure that there's proper transition from the incident to becoming whole again. Mm -hmm. right? So that gap is quite important. But, so we but, need but to you, create that. But you are done at this stage as the CCMA. Yes. You are done. The case is, yes. has been ruled uh, and they carry on with their lives. Yes. You can't get involved or, or, or can you get involved beyond that point? Or should you be get, get involved beyond that point? The only entry post that is through education. Yes. Because teaching people how to take care post-dispute. You know, the same principle applies when you're talking about a strike. I mean, the, you've got, you know, very big strikes that mm -hmm. happen, right? And people get injured. People die. People lose assets. Company assets get damaged. There's insults that happen and all of that. That happens. I mean, look at what happened in Cape Town, yeah. for example. You know, so when that happens and the strike is resolved, the go same back. people must go back to the workplace. Work together. The mistake that we're making yeah. is that once a dispute is resolved, at least as far as the dispute is concerned, but we still have relationship to deal with, we do not have the post-settlement instruments that ensure that the parties land properly when they go back to the workplace because mm -hmm. they still have to work together. Yeah. I may have insulted you while I'm standing at the gate and singing and saying... And you, and were, you, were, you, you were in the yard. You were I in was the, outside. Yeah, I was yeah. calling you names. And I remember you very well. I remember what you said to me. Yeah. The strike is resolved. Are we saying that has ended? Mm. That did no longer exist? Clearly not. What does it do to the continued relationship between the two, for example? Mm -hmm. So we need to have what I call the postnatal stage yeah. where we said we've resolved the disputes. And therefore, now for us to move on, the buildings have been damaged, mm. the cars have been touched, this one has been insulted, I have been injured, I have been arrested, and all of that, that we find a healing stage. Mm. When you read our constitution, and which is a, a serious pet subject for me, when you read the constitution, the preamble in particular, it's talking about healing as well. Mm. Healing. Now, if I look around about what we do other than legislating, and I look at the tempers when you're talking about employment equity, I ask myself, what is it that we are doing in practice to heal? Mm. And one of the legislations that is very sensitive, that can either make or break us in the healing exercise, mm. is the employment equity, because it has to do with race also. True. We're talking employment equity that says, for us to be a good society in South Africa, we must achieve equity. Can you achieve equity with the history that we have without healing? The healing we're talking about, it's a need. It's not just a constitutional obligation. Mm -mm. What is it in our workplaces that we are doing to heal? In practice. In practice, yeah. not what the constitution says, not what the act says. Because it's not just about legislation, mm. right? There's life before democracy. There's life, life after democracy. True. In the healing process, we, which one are we healing? Is it both or one of the two, huh. right? Because if we heal the wounds and, and all the things of the past, are we creating new ones in the democratic state for those that existed mm. after democracy? Simple example. You, we said in this company, there'll be seven black people. Yes. There were 10 white people. Yes. Now there has to be seven white uh, black people. Yes. That means there's seven that will, 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 seven white people that will lose their jobs. So that it, means you're creating new problems. While trying to solve another To solve, one. yes. And you know what is also interesting? I, I was very surprised that when we announced the settlement, included in the settlement agreement, was the confirmation that to meet your employment equity standards and requirements, you do not have to retrench people. Mm -hmm. and not an easy one. Not an easy to one. To apply. Yeah, because now you've got, like in your example, 
that so you have got 10 white people i need to have seven well seven black people, people. Yeah. so do i say that seven of white must go mm. let's take a worst case scenario and said okay i decide the seven must go yeah so how do you con contribute or how do you accommodate the seven who lost employment in your healing exercise constitutionally speaking the question is do you do you include them at all because others would argue yes. that they don't need healing <laughs> you see that could be an argument it is in fact yes. that, an argument that people yeah. raise right but if you look at the healing have we created a new wound now yeah. that later will require healing hmm. right the reality is the following i know that we are in a very difficult scenario while in pursuit of equity to try to correct the imbalances of the past is there a new form of imbalance we're creating so if a 2000 says i have absolutely no idea what you're talking about mm. about apartheid and exclusion and privileges to i was just been born yesterday true how is it that i'm not able to get employment because the employment equity standard says i don't qualify but mm. i am qualified because because of the color of my skin do i belong in the country or don't i belong in the country yeah. we must not be afraid to engage and ask those questions because we're afraid to be isolated mm. because the idea is if we are serious about healing which is an obligation can we measure if we are or not and as we try to achieve equity which we must do there's no issue you see one of the key issues we must debate how important is buy in mm. in achieving equity yeah. and, and that's collective buy in collective buy in everyone from everyone who is seen to have been the beneficiary and the one we're trying to uplift true without being seen to be creating new new victims. problems but because i saw a lot of anger i saw a lot of frustration from from which the side the dispute yes yeah, from you both know, from both sides yeah, yeah, you, yeah. You, but mostly on the side of those excluded okay. by legislation who feel that look this is race based and this is not correct are you saying and, those who benefited in the past yes, yes. they're saying this is reverse racism that's exactly for, the for expression example. that people use yes so how do we strike a balance because mm. i wh what i'm afraid of in the position i said is us not being free to discuss it mm. where do we discuss racial harmony exactly which platform are we using yeah. are we doing that in the workplaces where mm. exactly are we doing that is it possible and to me i want a random question is it possible that for us to achieve equity there's resistance because people feel they are victimized because they're excluded in trying to achieve equity mm. we must buy in that equity is important we must achieve equity that's why employment equity exists but it must be everyone must buy into that people yes those who are seen to be beneficiaries and those that's why i'm talking about the buy in part but you do realize that not everyone will buy into that no. because it's a it's a white and black and and I'm not talking about races I'm talking about about two different sides of the coin yes how do we strike the balance mm. if we buy in how do you if I'm white and I accept that ish you know being black in the past you were excluded you didn't have opportunities mm. I need to contribute for you to reach that point so that you and I can be judged on the same standard if i buy in into it let me help you to get there so that both of us can True. benefit if i resist i may not get there so there can never be sunset i'm slowing i'm slowing, I'm slowing, slowing this down the process. process i'm saying can we evaluate that huh. so that people like me and you who have been excluded huh. while we are racing towards equity can i get others who don't look like me to buy in for me to get there so that we can achieve equity you're asking a philosophical question yeah you know because <laughs> it's a difficult one it's a difficult one to solve what is even more difficult which is part of my study is do we know what equity means mm. also or is it in numbers that we're talking about to what extent is constitution influencing to what extent is it also fueled by healing process yeah is it because when there's resistance because we have not healed what is the issue but there is no compromise about one important thing yeah. equity must be achieved but while we trying to do that let's have consensus about what equity means because that's important for me yeah. so that if we have reached it we know we have is it based on numbers 
as we say in the workplaces, 20 must be black and women. So if we reach that, is that equity? Then let's say so. I'm mm. not saying it's wrong. I'm not saying that the standard let's, should let's, not be Let's applied. have a standard that applies. Can we be clear that it's not exclusive to numbers? Mm. Or if it is, let's say it is exclusive to numbers. Let's all agree. That's a, and workplaces keep changing. There's, there's, there's attrition that happens. People get dismissed. People die. They leave the workplaces and all of that. So that's why there's a bigger debate about issues of sunset. When will equity end so that everybody can be judged in terms of their qualification, not because of race, gender, and all of that? So it becomes such a difficult yeah. subject to make. It, we're we're look, looking at the dynamics of South Africa and its inequality. We're nowhere near it. We're no. nowhere near that, that, no. that step. Yeah. Some would even say we haven't moved from where we started. You know? we, we, are, we are struggling. If I look at the report of the Employment Equity Commission and I look at numbers, yes, we are struggling mm. uh, in terms of reaching those targets that we've made. But do we know exactly why we're doing that? Mm. I think that's where the inquiry should be. Do, do we, are you asking, do we know why we're struggling? Yes. Yeah. What's causing us not to reach the target that we should be reaching? What, what has been your observation? It's the victimology issue is part of it. Yeah. Is that I'm excluded, therefore I'll do things my way and I'm interested in that. Two, this thing that it's race-based also, okay. that it's about a certain race, is not about me, mm. so I'm not going to be part of it. Okay. Right? That does play a role. And I've seen it in the cases that I'm white and male, therefore I can never be appointed. But mm. the employment equity does not say so. Mm -hmm. there is, in fact, if you look at the settlement agreement we've signed, it specifically confirms what the fact that exists there is no prohibition of employment of white male in terms of the employment equity. Based on, based on race and on gender? Race. No, they, yeah. they, we don't have such a prohibition. It's, it's there. It's a matter of achieving targets and looking at the sector, looking at the industry, and be able to employ white males when circumstances and also getting exemption because you, you can apply for exemption mm. to the department and said, well, I'm not able to reach my target because the workplace, the sector, the economy, there's a list of things that the mm -hmm. act creates mm. which a workplace or an employer can apply to be exempted from the set standards and not to be punished. And right? basically saying I can't find a qualified employment, employ, em, 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 equity yes. uh, employee in this regard. To do this. And yeah. you submit that as part of the reasons. And the department will then evaluate whether it is a justifiable ground for you not to meet the standards. Mm -hmm. But I just wish us to have this picture. Yeah. All of us saying, this is the outlook. This is how we must look. Then if we achieve this, we have reached equity. It's a... It's an ideal picture, uh, and it assumes a lot of things. It assumes we are all have a simil similar level of education, uh, because you have to you have to see the world a different way. It assumes that we we all have backgrounds where we agreed, and we we come from a background where we we disagreed constitutionally. Yes, you yes, know, yes. our constitution said you are you go that way, and others go that way. So it assumes a lot of things, which is probably why. It may not happen in your lifetime. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it may not happen while we, you, and life, I exist. No, yeah. It'll probably be solved by those that come behind us that are saying, we don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, And let's yeah. start looking at this world a different way. Those that are currently, oh, chances are they will be voting for the first time in next year's election. They will have a completely different perspective. They have a different picture of, of because they don't have of that the background. World. They have of, no of the world. background, so, yes. It's so, a, so, well, I've applied, I qualify, so I'm an appointed. And you're explaining the history, the imbalances of the past, the exclusions, the apartheid issue, and said, oh, yeah, I hear that, but so but, what's that got to do with me? Yeah. We must find a way <laughs> to make that understanding on what equity means in the era we live in, how it connects to history. True. But then if we don't, if we don't engage everyone in the history, because not everyone, because yeah, yeah. we have to, you see, the thing about what, what you what you advocate for is everyone must come on, come along. On board. Yes, everybody must move with this. Yes. There's no way we will. No, <laughs> Eish, you know, uh, yeah, maybe not in our lifetime, but yes. the ideal is for all of us to feel it's our responsibility for us to be equitable. Let, 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 mm -hmm. let me, let, let's use this scenario equally. All of us must feel it's our responsibility to vote. Yes, 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 yes. We struggle with that. Yes, people don't vote. 
and especially the young people. You see. And, and there's the election next year, for see. example, now. Because not um, everybody feels this is important. Yeah, I, I saw the IEC was concerned about, uh, you know, the voter turnout. Um, it's our constitutional voter right. Voter regis register. Yeah, no, yeah, voter registration. Yeah, it's yeah. all of those. Yeah, so that's yeah. why I say it's a... It, and I, and I love your passion about it, but I say, whoa, where do we start? Yeah. It has to it has to start in, in the workplace, in the household, in the home. It has to start with a a fantonder explaining to their one one him accepting that what happened in the past was wrong. Mm. It starts mm. there, mm. Mm. and we're not there. No, <laughs> there's, there's patches of that. You know, the, the, the important Nelson Mandela once said, in our society. There are good and bad people, mm. and and it, it's our duty to find good people. It is impossible for us to have everybody agreeing. It is impossible to have everybody supporting. We True. must accept that fact. But while we accept that, the majority needs to join in. True. Because we need to achieve equity. Mm. I know how it's like to be excluded. And many of you, you know Absolutely. how it's like to be excluded. Yeah. But I need to have all my fellow South Africans working with me and with that understanding. Say, Let's help you get there yeah. so that you and I can come from the same clean slate and move forward. Because that's to me what equity means. It's not so much about the legal issue. Mm -mm. It's not really about that. It's not about race, really, and all of that. Yes, race is important because that's the standard. Mm. Either, but it's not the only test. Mm -mm. You know, if you if you look at at, at those who qualify um to be to, to be the beneficiaries now, Africans, women, mm. both black and white, those are the ones that are supposed to benefit from that. Mm. Right? But let us be clear about our target, yeah. which is equity. Let's help each other to get there. Let's understand how it looks like. We can't deny our history. Mm -mm. We cannot do that. But, we must, that but that, we must all accept it. Yes, <laughs> and move forward. Exactly. And correct the wrongs. Yeah. And ensure that we achieve equity. Buy-in is key. To that, but it's the conversation that we must have with our families. Yeah. We must have it with our kids. We must have it in church. We must have it in the workplaces. True. We must have it in our social circles. We create what we call in the past the rainbow nation. When we sing the national, national anthem, you know, I really get worried that 29 years after democracy, when we sing the national anthem, we still read it from the screens. Mm. <laughs> Why? The, the, Af the Africans' bit is, it tends to be tricky. <laughs> And, 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 and some of us will say, but the Zulu version is very tricky too. Yeah, of course. Of but course. then are we unified in doing that in the singing? You see, my worry is there's a difference between a singing an anthem and reciting it. True. Yeah. Reciting it is reading it, it's easy. Mm. But to internalize it, to know what it means, yeah. and to do the words what it says, it's something else. Do you see, what you're, what you're addressing... Uh, the social issues, yes. in essence, yes. because ultimately is is when I'm alone and I accept this environment and I want to play a role in trying to 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 solve it. The challenge with that, in my opinion, is we find ourselves now caught up in a lot of things that we deal with, everyday stuff, unemployment, a, a lack of electricity, water, you name it. Mm. My life is hard. Mm. And in the process, you're asking me to know the national anthem. Mm. Like, nah, va. You cannot guide this thing. Yeah, 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 va. I get any help from my canners, and I know you don't possess that idea. Yeah. Do you see how how now we've compounded our problems, and 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 now the social issues take a back seat. Mm. They're no longer as important. Mm. Do, do, does your child is it important for you in her in the house to talk about the history of the country to educate your kids? Oh, absolutely. Not, but do I have the time? Is it high on my agenda of things that I need to do? Yeah, no, it's not. We, yes. we, we, don't, we don't do that. And it ends up becoming an issue. A, a, by the way, subject, that, that, that takes me to this important concept of social justice. Mm. Um, it, it's also suffering the same fate as, as this definition issue. You know, every time I talk to different people and ask, when we say we achieve social justice, what do we mean? Mm. It's in the LRA, it's in the basic conditions, it's in the national minimum wage, but it's not in the Employment Equity Act. What, what does it mean? That's exactly the question terms. I'm asking in my <laughs> research. Why is it not there yeah. in the Employment Equity? And if there's any legislation that has a direct umbilical cord with the Constitution, is the Employment Equity Act. True. Because when you're talking about, if you look at Section 6, that talks about the grounds 
of dis- discrimination, and you look at Section 9 of the Constitution, it's like a carbon copy of that, mm. right? Mm. It is a superior legislation, if, if, you, if I may use that, mm. because of that umbilical court. Of course, um, the idea of it being that does not mean that others are not important. Mm. But if social justice is that important, there's no framework or policy or definition in any of the legislation that tells us what it means. Everyone gives you their version. The interpretation. The, the interpretation, yeah. right? Yeah. Will we know if I've achieved it if I do not know what, what it, means, it means or I know it to mean? You know, interesting, I was busy teaching, uh, you know, our users about the new rules of the system. Mm-hmm. They uh, applied, what, two months ago or so? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. In like May, April there. Right. Actually, actually, I, I, you, you played such an. You were standing in front of journalists and and yeah. all sorts of of people of yeah. stakeholders yeah. doing a lecture. I saw, yeah. I saw, yeah, that, saw on, that right? on YouTube. Yeah, yes. doing a lecture on that, yes. right? And as I was talking about social justice, and an an employers organization a representative stood up and asked a question. I said, "Director, tell me, why does the meaning of social justice exclude an employer?" Mm. Right. And I said, but why do you think it does? And I said, but I'm hearing you about unemployment, about enforcement, about everything else. What about employers? Are we not a component of social justice project? Mm-hmm. And I said, you are. There can never be an employee with, without an employer. Mm. And in fact, judgments such as the UCT versus Nehau judgment of, I think, somewhere in, in 1997, 1998, one of the key principles it's encouraging that in the process while we resolve disputes, let's try to strike a balance between the interests of the employer and the interests of the employee. Mm. In some cases, it's difficult. But in cases where you're dealing with retrenchment, for example, right, you need to have a look at that. Mm. During the process of collective bargaining, you need to do that. Let's, let's be practical, right? So if a union says, well, we need a 10% demand on our salary increases, and then in reality and truly, the employer says, I can't afford it, right? Mm. And I'm mediating that. I need to find a balance between the two. So I must say that if, therefore, we settle at 10, if I look at the financial statements of the company, in three months' time, they'll be liquidated. If True. not liquidated, then retrenchment will follow. I must engage there and say, let's balance the interest. Mm. Can't you review the 10? Because if you get it, this is the consequence. It's going to be a temporary pleasure. True. But it's going to hurt you a few months down the line. Mm. There's a big dispute I was involved in, which involved exactly that, where there was a strike that went for a couple of months. And during the process when I was busy, you know, trying to mediate, when I do the side caucuses and trying to break the deadlock, the employer said to me, if we agree to that demand that is made, we will be forced to retrench mm. a few months down the line. Are we, are we, are we saying it's okay? You go back and explain the same thing on the other side. I said, look, the employer can agree to this, but the problem is that this will cause retrenchment. True. And then others are saying, I, no, let's go ahead. We want that and all of that. You, it, and, it, it's a, a narrow perspective. Yeah. Yes. And you try and explain from different perspectives. This is dangerous yeah. to do this. I'm not saying you have a bad demand. And if you look at the needs, and then that might do that. But you might enjoy that for three or six months, but you may be without work after that. Mm. Do you really want to do that? If you choose to do so, and the employer said, look, we are tired, we're losing billions of rents, so let's agree. You agree. Mm. And, of course, three months down the line, the notice comes out, Section 189, mm. we intend to return 6,000 people because we can't afford it because of this. we did warn about this. And at the retrenchment, actually, the employer has an upper hand there. Yeah. While there's an obligation to engage, to avoid it, to mitigate it, but in the end, the employer has the final say on the retrenchment. Mm. And you may have had an increase for a few months, but you've lost it. But it's not every workplace, it's not every demand that comes with that consequence. Mm-hmm. The principle I'm pushing is there has to be a proper evaluation and a balance of interest of the employer and employee. Mm. The same principle with the meaning of social justice is that if, therefore, I have been dismissed, if my case is heard quickly and I get the matter concluded quickly and there's an award that is issued and the content of the award is implemented mm. and the employer does so, right? That's, that's social justice, mm. 
you know? And that's an achievement of that. If I have needs and we engage effectively and we achieve consensus on my terms and conditions and having regard to all other factors and I'm better placed socially, economically and financially, mm -hmm. that is social justice. But we cannot have different faces of it. There must be a uniform understanding of what it means so that when we pursue it, we have consensus. But, but the, in my in my research, I found this happen common uh, uh, often, where an employer uh, a dispute would be settled uh, by yourself as CCMA that uh, that benefits and fair dismissal case that benefits the uh, in favor of the employee. Mm. Uh, the muscle, financial muscle that comes with the employer, mm. they would then say they want to take the case into uh, on review. It's a common thing. Mm. And I can drag for quite a long yes. time. Yes. That is the very social justice that you speak of, yes. where now it disadvantages this person completely. There's a, a lady who, who who went on for eight years and, and went through this, this pain, lost everything, uh, because the employer had the ability to drag this for as long as they could, knowing that her life gets more frustrated. When she eventually got a settlement, which was the option that she took, was a six-month salary, having lost eight years of her life. Mm. Of, of that, clearly, that, there's, a, there's a tactic that a lot of employers apply to, to frustrate the employees. SCCMA and your ability to see this, because you're, you're obviously aware of, of this practice, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, do, what, do, what, what do you do and what role can you play in, in a space such as that? Because that's the social justice we speak of now. It is. L let me compound the problem yeah. and then talk uh, and answer your question. There are matters post-award that do take seven years and plus. Hmm. Post-award? Post-award. In favor of yes. yeah, the employee in this context. Yes. And yeah. in some cases, it's not about in favor of employee only. In some cases, it's purely technical, mm. not on the substance. Oh. And I can give you real cases now at Concord. There's a case, for example, we call it the Pyman's Pantry, right? It, it, is, it is a very interesting case. Despite the content of the award and the, I'm trying to em, enforce it and everything else, the question that arose is whether a dispute after three years can prescribe. Mm -hmm. Let me explain the difference for those who may not know. That when you refer a dispute and it's late, you have to apply for condemnation. Mm -hmm. You give reasons in terms of our rule nine that, well, the reason for lateness is this, the degree of lateness is this, True. and all of those kinds of things. And I've got prospects. And, and if it's a good submission, then we grant it. Mm -hmm. Then the case proceeds. True. That's one case. Yeah. But if you have an award in your favor that has not been implemented, or you have an unfair dismissal, or unfair labor practice case that you have not referred for three years plus, mm -hmm. then it's bordering on prescription. Prescription is death. Mm, for the... For the referrer. Exactly. If yes. your case is three years plus and you have not referred it, your case is dead, you can't go on it. Hmm. Right? This case of Pyman's Pantry was about prescription. Right? There's another case that was dealt before that that talks about the award, whether it is subject to the Prescription Act. So what it effectively means is that you can't wait for three years or more for you to refer your case, whatever case you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It must be initiated within three years, but you still have to explain why it's late. Mm -hmm. But once it is beyond three years and you come to the system, we must make a decision whether a case has prescribed or not. Mm. So in this payment's case, and I, I did another case that where I applied that judgment, the issue here is that the case dragged on all the way to the constitutional court purely on that technical issue, not the content. Jeez. <laughs> not the content. Yeah. But it ran for that law. And 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 business continues. Oh, of course. Em employee gets continues to be frustrated. Oh yes, that's the reality of the matter. Yeah. And that's part of the things I'm raising about issues of e expedition in uh -huh. my research. Uh -huh. I, I say, how do we explain this? When you're looking at Section 138 of the Labor Relations Act, it says that we must deal with dispute quickly. True. At CCMA level, we do that. Uh -huh. When the case is concluded, 14 days, the award is out. Uh -huh. On average, you know. Our cases take about, you know, nine, it's, uh, three months or so mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. do that. Others drag beyond that. You know, there are exceptions uh, to the rule. That's understandable. So then the scenario you talk about then arises. Mm -hmm. I have an award that says reinstate, reinstate. with back pay. Mm -hmm. I get excited that I have won my case because that's what winning means. Mm -hmm. right? And this was a month-long CCMA issue. Done, right? Very good. Take it to the employer and say, 
data. So I want my job back. I want my job back. Yeah. Says who? Says this man. Right? They look at it and said, well, we're not happy with the outcome, so we are going to review it. Mm. That it's their right to do so. There's remedies that are available. No. What we've settled in the labor market, there are genuine cases that are challenged, but there are those that are done purely for delay. Mm -hmm. That's that's clear, yeah. right? So others will start the review. On that thought, which ones do you see happen often? It's difficult to tell. Yeah. It's difficult. To, I can't even give you numbers which okay. one is more, which one is less. Yeah. Right? But but that happens. Th yes. That's a fact. It happens. Yes. Because others, you know what others do? They'll just take it on review and leave it at that. Just that initial part, issue the, you know, the notice of motion attached with the affidavit, I've reviewed, get a case number, leave it at that. Let's go to that. Yes. What can you do as an employee? As an employer? Yeah. But actually as an employee, as an employee in this employee, context. This, this is yes. what you can do. Yeah. So firstly, if a review is lodged the labor court and you, there's no action taken on that. It's stuck. You can bring an application to have that matter actually uh, dismissed. At CCMA? At the labor court. At the labor court, Because okay. that's where it's lodged. Yes. But some of the cases, because of time and all of those things, you know, there, there are new provisions that talks about the status of those cases at mm -hmm. review stage, right? So you get the case archived and all of this. But the main issue is that as an employee, when a review has been lodged, mm -hmm. There's no action taken. You do not sit back and wait. Mm. Because just look at the scenario where somebody has been dismissed and people can barely survive in a month, even if they are employed. Yeah. Can you just imagine where there is no employment? Mm. You have an award that gives you money. That says you must go back to work. But it's stuck because there's a review application. True. There's nothing in law in between, financially speaking, that puts you in a better position. You are in the worst scenario. Sometimes people appoint even in the position that you're dismissed in, they continue with life mm. while you're still fighting the case. Some of the challenges that applicants have is affording legal representation to be able to do exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. The issue of knowledge of law that I spoke about earlier then becomes a factor mm. that I do not know what I need to do. I, like I said I must wait until the review is complete. But it's sitting there, it's not being prosecuted. Yeah. You do not know that you can come and apply and get that quashed. Right? Do, you, do, you, do you need legal, legal representation no, to, you don't. to do that? Yeah. You don't need it in terms of requirements, mm. but you do need it because of the technicality of law of having to do it, okay. if it makes sense. But right? then the then issue of affordability becomes a serious factor in this case. It is a big factor. Yeah. If you are lucky to get pro bono work, mm. where there are lawyers at the labor court who do work pro bono, and you get other lawyers as part of their social responsibility as the LPC requires us to do, and then who's prepared to do the case for free. Yes, of course. But there's also a perception that if somebody does your case for free, they don't put the same effort and all like somebody who's a paying client. True. Right? Ask yourself this question. How many of our members of society whose cases are sitting in the labor court, not prosecuted, because they can't afford to pay a lawyer to make sure that the matter is, in fact, enforced. And they have an award from CCMA that, that says, says go back go to back work to and work. be paid. Yes. So you look at that and you look at the award, that causes a lot of pain. Yeah. Right? Even those that afford, that have a lawyer that they get appointed, it's not the, it's not the solution. Mm -hmm. Because it's an opposed matter, you continue fighting now for the next five to seven years. Yeah. In the meantime, you're not employed. Sure. Unless if you're lucky enough, you get other employment where you can fund your lawyer to fight the case until to the end. Yeah. It's a serious gap that exists. Sure. So if it takes three years for the labor court and you lose, you go to the labor appeal court two, two, three years again. Yeah. You lose again, you go to the con court. That's what happens like the Stumo case and others that goes up to seven years plus. Mm. A case of a of a security guard, for that matter. We are not talking about somebody who's sophisticated here. Somebody who's a security guard who did the job badly got dismissed and all of that. Mm. The so the matter ran all the way to the Constitutional Court. And I asked myself, how many of our people like that know what's happening? Sure. Why am I not going to back to work because the CCMA said so? Mm. Right? So you wait yeah. until the whole process comes. So now, <laughs> look at it realistically. Yeah. So if after seven, seven years, like it happened with the Dumo case and, and all of that, the court said, well, we confirmed that the dismissal was unfair mm. and therefore the outcome of the commissioner is correct. In some cases, when you go back, the company has changed ownership. 
some has closed down. Life has mo- moved on. Your position has been closed. And, or and redundant. Of, and redundant <laughs> yes. in, in that case. In some cases, you come back, you, and then they take you back, three months down the line, you are retrenched. True. And So what happened to the seven years that oh. we're talking about? We have to look at reality because that's the reality. Mm. It's even worse, you know, for me, if it fought for that long, purely on technical basis. In some cases, it goes that long, and they say, well, the award is set aside. You know what that means? Mm-hmm. You no longer have an award. And they say, remit back to the CCMA. Start again. You, you start again after seven years or five years wow. and do an arbitration. How In, does it get to that, though, that the, the award is, is, is no longer applicable? Oh, it's a wide range of issues. You see, in our law, our awards, especially in terms of the Labor Relations Act, it's called a review. It's it's largely supposed to be process-based. Mm-hmm. If the commissioner disregarded certain evidence or it did not apply, okay. it did not okay. apply his mind to the evidence properly or there is no rationality between the evidence evaluated and the decision. That, so there's a wide range mm-hmm. of factors mm-hmm. which are all legal in nature, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So a person who is not a lawyer and you, you do have very good union officials who are very good at doing this, mm-hmm. who understand this, who can challenge it, right? But the painful part is you can't stop it from happening. No. You have to go through the pain, time, cost to have it resolved. But but you're saying you're saying it could be expedited or yes. it could be reviewed in yes. terms of how long it should take. Well, in terms of how long it takes, you can't. You can't control you that. You can't control yes. that because, for example, once all the papers, you know, the labor court is very busy mm. and they are really short of judges. They are really short of uh, courtrooms. Mm. There's a report that says, when the judge president always says that, while we accept that challenge, it does have an impact at the speed at which the case gets resolved because there are no courts, there are no judges. Mm. And what then do you do? You have to wait. You, you, You conclude the process today. You still have two to three years right, to wait. <laughs> and, and they tell you, well, your case will be set down in 2025. So Jeez. between now and then, then what happens? Right? <laughs> you are and unemployed. You're unemployed. And we're still preaching social justice. Yes. So then somebody starts asking themselves, Gandhi, what does social justice mean? Mm. But at the same time, somebody will tell you, well, we all are equal before the law, and the constitutional court is the final arbiter on all cases. So I'll drag you through that. You see, the thing that you mentioned earlier on, which is part of the reason me for me to move from union to, to CCMA, one mm. of the things that used to drive me was exactly what we're discussing about now, mm. right? I remember there was an employer who said, well, I don't care. You can go to the CCMA if you want. I have enough budget. I'll fight you all the way for the next 10 years. And and for the fun of it. And just what whatever the CCMA is, I really don't care, yeah, yeah. right? I'll fight you all the way, bragging about I have the budget yeah. to fight cases like that. It hurts, <laughs> right? And because, I, the, you know, the union I was at is a public sector union and all of that. And I said to myself, but this is wrong. Mm. This can't be correct, right? And in some cases, when you go to the CCMA and go to the bargaining councils, and it's a conciliation, some don't attend. Mm. They said, it's a conciliation, what can happen? So I'm not there. So you can't even settle the dispute. Sure. People don't show up there. And then you issue a default award. They said, well, it's a default, I'll rescind it. Yeah. They apply for a decision, give reasons, they lose. No, I'll take it to the labor court. It runs for the next five years fighting the rescission because you don't agree with it. Mm-hmm. And then after five years, others die while waiting. <laughs> others give up. Others don't have the means to continue fighting. Others just simply lose interest. Yeah. How do you prevent that then? There is no method, at least at CCMA level, that we can use to prevent that. Is there is there anything within the other layers of, of uh, uh, Labor Relations Act that can help to... to to, to, to help someone in, the, in a situation like this? No. Or you just wait it out? No, there isn't. Other than you applying to have the matter dismissed and other than ensuring that the process runs properly in terms of the timelines to get it done, you can't expedite it. That's it. You can't expect, there's no other, it's not, it's out of your control, actually. Mm, mm. Once it's there, it has to run. It's there course. are others who are there before you mm. that are also They've waiting. They've been waiting. They've been waiting like you until uh, their cases are heard. But what pains me is that there are those that are just done, not because of merit or anything, just to frustrate you. And for me, that's the unethical part of this exercise where it's pure injustice for me how an employer 
can afford this. They have the financial muscle to drag it for 20 years. Yes. And, and you, you, your life gets worse and worse and worse every minute yes. while you're waiting for this. Yes. And they carry on like it doesn't matter. You become a line item on, on the HR department. Oh, we have that little thing we have to deal with. And they can afford to get legal advice and so forth. You don't. It almost sounds like a, 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 a sundowns playing Chiefs. No, sorry. Bad example. <laughs> <laughs> Very bad example. <laughs> it sounds like a Bella League Let's team. Let's let it go. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a Bella League team playing against uh, uh, playing against Manchester United. And you, you get walloped. And but, you're expected to win the game. But you know what my greatest fear is? Yeah. In as much as you can stand it and you run f the case for four years and even if three years or all of that, and then with an award on review, and then they say, this is the biggest gap, mm. right? Which is not which is not covered. So you lose your case at, at, at the review level. They said, go back to the new commissioner. Mm. We're back. Certain witnesses are no longer available. Certain documents are missing and all of the So dynamics change, mm. right? And there's no protection against that, right? So you start afresh. Because whatever you did in the last time doesn't count anymore. It's a fresh case for a, fresh case. a new commissioner. Oh, right? boy. We listen to that. You get an award again, uh. right? You win the case again. They said, oh, you're back again. Review Let's again. review again, yes. right? You run it again another three years or four, five, seven oh, years. My goodness. You go to Concord again, back again. There is no rule or law that says you can only review once. Wow. How do you balance that? This is what kills me. How many times can you review and taking back to CCMA? Over and over and over While fighting the same case because there is no limit to it. For as long as the employer decides I'm not going to accept you and I can fight you about decision and then I lose at Concord, let's start on arbitration award. You start again. On the award, I don't like it and review again. So that vicious circle. You, you do realize that, you know, crime when I come and steal your car or kill you, uh, it's clear who, who's wrong. Yes. I did this to you. Uh, you. Your life has changed so much. Your family's life has changed so much because of my act. It's pretty clear who should be punished in this case. Yes. In, in a case of someone who is job and livelihood has affected so drastically, it's easy to say, well, the company has a full right to continue fighting this. Mm. He says, but I've worn it. Mm. Where is the humanity in, in this picture? Because they sh the, social justice, this is where it should play its role. Where yes. we say, this person's life has been affected so negatively. Clearly, we, somebody here has to say, wait a minute. This has to be looked at differently. And you're saying, no part of the law has that moment where somebody says, whoa, this is wrong. None. And this is Uchabu, Manza, Rosina's life has been affected. Children can't go to school anymore. And we're happy to carry on with our lives. That's exactly what happened. There's a tumor case where a security guard and the case ran all the way to Concord for seven years plus. There's nothing you can do in between until you wait for the outcome at Concord. That's the reality. There's no intervening strategy. There's no intervening law that can say because you have no income, well, the let's let's, let's money, help you out. Let's help you out. There isn't. That's the reality. So the principles of social justice get tested there. That yeah. because the a simple rule of social justice is outcomes of courts and outcomes of arbitrations must be enforced. They must be honored. Because an award, it is like an order of court. True. Right? But still we say, while we say that, that this one has a right to challenge it anyway. Mm -hmm. And they do. Right? There are those, <laughs> there are those employers who do the right thing. Yeah. Who say, you okay. know what, in your favor, okay, that's fine. So we're reinstating you Let's back. Let's move on. Yes, you do have those. And we're not going to paint anyone and say everyone is reviewing. Not everyone is re reviewing. But for me, even if you review mm. purely on technical and you don't enforce, there is no punishment. I, I'm still here to see an award not challenged at court but still not enforced, somebody ending up in jail yeah. or paying a fine. And that's never happened. Because that should be a contempt of court. There are piles of cases of contempt that are sitting in the labor court, you know? Sure. 
My, that's exactly my because, because it's not similar to a crime that I exp- I, I described earlier. No, it's that's not, different. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, it's, it's not. It's a. It's a. Ah, well, he didn't. He he was too loud in court. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It falls in that category. Yeah, yeah. And there isn't a solution. You have to run the entire process until it completes. But for me, the vicious circle is frustrating the very reason why LRA is created. Yeah. The very reason why National Minimum Wage Act and Employment Act is created because really if I have the resources and I really don't want to, I can keep fighting. Mm. There are good fights that people put up for right reasons. Just get me right. There isn't, there, there is those cases. Mm, Genuine where, cases yeah. you fight and you win. It, it, it doesn't matter what you do. The employer was right yeah. in all of that. There, there are those cases and there, there's, there's many of them. Mm. But you do have these other ones as well. Where it's just fight they, for the sake of it. They just run amok. No individual in the company would be held res- uh, responsible unless it's within the policy of that company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That if you incorrectly dismissed, you are liable for everything that comes with it. But that's not common practice. No, it's not. Because it's the company is the person. It's the entity. It's yes, the entity exactly. with people in it. It takes one decision, review it, take it to lawyers. That, that's that's all it takes. And then the lawyers will take it and will run with it. Yeah, it's a fee. They get we'll, we'll, yes. We'll, we'll run they with get it paid. And, and, and fight with it. But there's another dimension to that. In cases where in one of those cases where you are successful, you get reinstated, and you you get your back pay. Mm-hmm. But it's not all you've lost when you were dismissed. Mm-hmm. We must remember that. Yeah. Right. One of the cases that people don't really do, and I don't know why, right, is the damages claim. Mm -hmm. I understand the back pay, but during the employment, unemployment, Mm. as a consequence of your decision, now the court that says it's Your wrong wrong decision. I lost a car. I lost a house. I lost medical aid. My child died because I could not provide... All of those things. I lost reputation reputation because you made me me look as a bad person. Yes. So I need to claim damages. Whoa. And in the LRA, you can't claim damages at the CCMA. You have to go to the labor court. Uh-huh. But here's an interesting dimension. Damages claim is permitted in the Employment Equity Act. Mm. I just can't find what the difference is. That if you're at the CCMA and I've suffered these damages, I have to go to the labor court. Why can't I do the same? Um, on damages the same as you do with employment equity. That's it, yeah. Why the difference? <laughs> yeah. Right? Because in equity, the damage largely is emotional. It's psychological, mm-hmm. right? You discriminated against me. You harassed me. True. And therefore, I need satisfaction. Mm. And in doing that, I'm claiming for damages. But how humiliating can it be to be dismissed unfairly? And, and is it how do we weigh the scale? Yeah, because because one one depending on your experience of it, one would say being dismissed unfairly, your reputation being damaged, losing all that is far more weighty because it's it, physical. It, I can touch it and feel it. In fact, it, it's about dignity. Yeah, and Un- there's no dignity in unemployment. No, there isn't. There is no dignity in poverty. Mm-hmm. There's no dignity in being unable to provide for a family because of a dismissal. Yeah. If it's about dignity, then it's a constitutional issue. If it is a constitutional issue, then you need to punish it more because you are violating not only my statutory right, you're right. also damaging my constitutional right. Yeah. Why can't I claim damages at least at the tribunal court system without having resorting to the, to the labor court? Because to fight damages, it's a whole new level. Mm. It's a whole new claim with different requirements that apply on how you claim damages, how you quantify your damages, True. and or you need a, an expert counsel yes. to argue <laughs> that. But when people go back to work, they get back pays, they really don't take it further than that because they think I'm back at work. If I do this, I might damage the relationship and all of that. Yeah. There is no compensation for someone who is told you are reinstated but the company is closed down. Mm, there's nothing. What does it make of the awards we make? That's the question for me. My mockery. That's my my problem. Yes. That you know, I in, in, as as director David, I have incidences where somebody will phone mm. and say, "I am here with an award coming from the CCMA." When I got this award, I sat down with my family. We celebrated that I've won the case. I got my job back. Tell me, 
does winning mean I must go back to work and be paid as the award says? I said, yes. So now the employer is not taking me to court, but they have not paid me and I'm not back at work. Mm. What must happen now? It's enforcement of the award. Mm. So we've got a process of enforcement uh, where you fill in the form and you do that, right? When you get to the place, it was David's company. Mm. When you get there, it's now Cameron. Same Jeez. building, same managers, but their shareholding has changed, mm. right? The control and power has changed. They said, well, well, that company was sold. This is a new company. Doesn't exist anymore. Doesn't exist. The name has changed and everything else has changed. And then what happens there? And this didn't happen because of you. No. It was the natural the process ordinary, of the of company. Yes. In the ordinary course, sometimes because of time lapse. True. That it has taken. So things have changed. Yeah. Right? And then, then what happens with that? In other cases where it is just purely a compensation award, mm -hmm. where there's no reinstatement or reemployment, you must be paid 100,000 rand. You go to the sheriffs. The sheriffs, they go there and do to attach the assets of the employer. They find everything there. As the sheriff is trying to attach these things, and they said, well, these do not belong to the employer, mm -hmm. so you can't attach them. Jeez. Right? You can't touch them. You take them. We call the interpleader proceedings. Then we must go now debate, mm. let alone what your claim is, mm. on whether these assets belong to the employer or not. In some cases, while you have this shell called building called mm. Company X, yeah. the assets inside are owned by a different company. Yo. So you can't attach this asset in this building because they belong to a different company. Mm. And, you, and ca you can't attach a quarter of the building. No, you can't. <laughs> yes. And then when you can't attach, but you've got money, then what happens? Yeah. This is the frustration that I have. And then somebody says, then tell me, Cameron, so what do I do? I got them, but they said, I can't touch these assets. Mm. And they say, okay, who decides where the assets, can you CCMA do that? No, we don't even have jurisdiction for that. You're done. No, that's a match court issue. Go to the magistrate court and go there and go and go. You go to the magistrate court, they said, well, this thing was done at CCMA. Go back to the CCMA. Wow. You, this is the, my, my <laughs> frustration. Yeah. And I go to the legislation and said, oh, you must enforce the award as if it's the match court order. I said, okay, what does this mean? Magistrates don't even know that. Mm -mm. They said, but I don't, we don't know what that, what that means. This is not a court order coming from the match court. So you sorted it at the CCMA. Go to the Labor Court. Labor Court said, well, if it was at CCMA, there's no application in the Labor Court for enforcement in terms of Section 158. Well, we can't do that here. You realize that if, 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 if Sulawena, <laughs> we ordinary folks are in trouble. Yes. That's why, that's part of the reason why I'm here. Yeah. To say that I know the frustrations that people go through. I know companies that suffer because they accept demands that they can't afford and they end up liquidating and shutting down and everybody becomes unemployed. Mm -hmm. I know people who got awards that they want to enforce the company can take them back because they are fighting it. Yeah. I know people who give up cases because they can't go to the local they can't afford it. And then this right of access to tribunal, which is the constitution that gets frustrated. And I know all of those things, but those are law reform or legislative issues that cannot be handled, at least at the CCMA. Mm -hmm. And the, even the courts have limitations. Yeah. There are things that law can fix. There's things that courts can fix, right? But you've got to know what your right is and what you ought to do. CCMA enforces awards. Courts enforces awards. You can claim compensation and all of that. You. It's a matter of knowing mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. But the speed of reform becomes part of the problem. Yeah. You know, in outcomes, like the Makanya, the domestic worker judgment I was talking about, when the Concord took a decision that this is unconstitutional, then the legislation was amended. Mm. In some cases, the court will specifically say that this is invalid, but new changes must be done within the next two years. Yeah. That's fine. But there are cases where the court does not make a pronouncement. Then what happens hmm. when there's a lacuna? There's a, a gap, a, 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 a silence. That yes. No one is saying anything, but yes. somebody must be saying something. Yes. While we yeah. do exceptional work, while many of our words would be implemented, some after court, some not in court, but there are those also in between that fall into the cracks because of 
gaps in law mm -hmm. because of also the gap between institutions like court and legislature. Mm -hmm. So the speed at which we do it also becomes a factor. What, what do you say to, to a perception that says, and, I, and I'm asking this, this question as, as loose as it sounds, that says the CCMA is not, is not helpful to my situation. They, they, the case is dragging too long or they're in favor of the employer than they are in, in favor of, of the employee. Hey, we've been getting that for years, yeah. right? Even before my time. Let's talk about the time it takes. Yeah. For a case to take long, a number of factors come into, into the equation. Mm. Part, of which, part of that is legal representatives who from time to time will say, you know, the, the reality of it is that I come there as a lawyer and I say, well, we're postponing now. Mm. When are we available? Well, my daddy says I'm only available in six months' time. Between then, my client can't come here. I can't do the case. Mm -hmm. So six months waits, right? Yes. And in some cases, parties agree that, okay, we agree, but we're only available in two months' time. That's by agreement. True. Right? So that contributes into that. The other is about capacity of the system mm -hmm. to say, well, like now we get budget cuts like we did, they take 100 million, they take all those kind of things. And then the number of commissioners that I can use for those cases then gets limited. So the speed at which you set the matter down is no longer the same. Mm -hmm. So because of the variety of factors, then it gets delayed in that mm -hmm. way. But the majority of it is done within reasonable time, mm -hmm. right? Let's talk about the in favor of. Yeah. That always has been the case. You know, I've always looked at statistics. And sometimes when people claim your awards are in favor of employers, I look at stats, they represent otherwise. What are the stats saying? Well, at least we, roughly. I don't have the latest reports on at the moment on how I can I can get you that on how many are in favor and but in the equation of looking at awards, it's also not a full measure mm -hmm. because some of the cases get settled. Yes, which right? which won't reflect won't reflect necessarily as, a favor or as favor in, or against. against. Yeah. So that skews your numbers. Okay, because if it says we settle but we pay you, you're not going back to work. Then it's an issue. We develop something we call return to work index, okay. right? The return to work is that the primary remedy that the LRA provides is reinstatement. Mm -hmm. That if somebody is substantively, uh, the dismissal is un substantially unfair, the best remedy is job security, which is return, return to, to work. work. Yeah. So we, 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 we measure that. Mm -hmm. right? All cases that meet this standard are matters of reinstatement. We it, don't instruct. Irrespective right? of whether there's a review after what you've done. It doesn't matter. Review yeah. come post that decision that is made. Yes. Right? Yes. So if then we say in favor of, which is another dimension. So let's say 10 cases are in favor of employees, but the five of those cases get reviewed. Mm -hmm. After three years or four years, those cases are dismissed at the labor court. The award is set aside. True. Do we call that success? Well, there was success, but now it's no longer success. It's no longer success. And if you if you were measuring statistically, you will say it's success because purely on award. Exactly. But if you go deeper and say you find is this that... person back at work, no. no, the award has been set aside. Yeah. So the numbers get skewed hmm. because of those factors. So when somebody makes a claim that our awards are more in favor of employers, yeah, they are not having regard to these factors I'm raising uh, to measure to say it's in favor. And also it's seasonal. You may find in one year, more awards are in favor of employees and the year after is in, in favor of employers. Mm -hmm. So from the reputational point of view, which one would you say we are? Yeah. In favor of employee or employer? <laughs> or it depends, it depends on timing. Yes, it depends. <laughs> it does, depends on timing. The other claim will be a claim of corruption. Mm. You know, people will say your commissioners are corrupt and all of those. Nah, they, get, they can get bored. They, you, know, yeah, you know, yeah, yes. all of that. I always say, uh, for me, a claim is one thing, uh, but to corroborate is another. True. There's one thing I learned from the president, Osiru uh, Ramaphosa said at one point when all these issues of allegations happened and all of that, he said, you know, it's okay and it's easy for someone to allege mm. that you've done so, but the bigger task is for them to, to follow through and prove what they're talking about. Mm. And in any case, you can never stop somebody from alleging. That's true. You absolutely have no control on allegations that people make. Mm. It is your response and the corroboration of the allegation that matters. Mm. So we do get those kinds of complaints. And I always say, I will listen, but give me something to work on. Mm. Until then, 
my commissioner is innocent. True. He has not done so yes. until you show me that. There has been certain incidences, you know, we're not going to paint a picture that we have not found people have done wrong mm. on the commissioners. There has been. Yeah. There has been cases where, I remember this one incident, the commissioner said bad things during a break, mm. right? You don't have a case and, and saying all those kind of things, you either settle or you're going to lose. And S saying saying this to the employee. Yeah, but yeah. not realizing that the employee was recording. Ooh. Right? Yes. And he recorded the whole conversation, right? After recording the conversation, they then transcribed the discussion. Mm. And then they sent that to me and said, this is the recording of what your commissioner was saying during the break. He was not aware that I was recording him. Yeah. Firstly, it was done without the knowledge of the commissioner. Of course. But I didn't use technicalities and said when the improper obtaining of the recording and all those True. kind of things, right? I took the package and sent it to commissioner. Commissioner, this is the transcript of what you said during the break mm. and to the other side. When he tried to explain what he meant, to me it said, okay, that's what you said. You're trying to explain to me what you said. Mm. But the things that you said are bad. True. That's not how we are. That's not who we are. And that's not how we operate. We've had cases where somebody, during the, like we're sitting here, an employer comes and is given a chocolate or something in the presence of the other party because mm. that's perception of bias. True. And we teach, you do not do that. Yeah. One of the basic rules that we teach is if we are the fighting parties and he is the commissioner, mm. right? If you walk in, both of us are here, that's fine. Mm. But if you find one sitting, you don't sit with them. Mm -mm. Even if you're talking about parrots and sundown. Don't sit. But don't engage yeah. in that stand outside. Even if you are sitting in the hearing room, one comes in and the other is not there. Mm. Do not allow them to come in until the other one is present. True. Because the issue of biasness is perception. Nothing more. Nothing if more. If they walk in and find you having a chat, even if it's about chiefs yeah. and sundowns, yeah. it's still it perception. Doesn't matter. Yeah. What else were you discussing prior? Do you also discuss post? True. Perception exists. Yeah. And you make rulings based on a party's perception. So conduct mm, during, even during the break, right? I, I even said, even if one party offers you water, do not take it. Jeez. <laughs> Don't get involved in anything mm. that creates perception. Busy with fun meets. Mm. Fun, um, lati, yes. fun yes. you know, why would, And when eventually I lose, give me a hand. One of the things that I've learned was when an employer gives an instruction to dismiss whatever it takes, mm. I could not handle that. I said, but what do you mean whatever it takes? Fairness issue and all of that, what about that? I said, mm. no, hell with that. People with disabilities are also protected by the Employment Equity Act. That's true. But how far do we do it to protect them then? Sure. Protection is not just recognition. From charging, generally, it's 48 hours from charging to do a hearing. Preparation. Preparation time. is for it. But, you know, depending on the size. Of course. If it's the CEO's charge because he ran the company to the ground, well. you can't prepare in two days. No, no, no. King King David Studio Podcast.